Hello everyone, how's it going? Lovely to see you all. Let me know if the audio is working all right and if you can hear me. Hello Naxergs, Killer King, howdy howdy. Unusual Box, how's it going? The Crone's Eye, how's it going Kate? Jason, Sonorense Nueve Leon. John Bailey Owen. How's it going, everyone? Sounds great. That's good. Okay, so I don't have a whole lot of time here, um, but I figured, you know, we're going to get the, some DLC nuggets today, hopefully. <laughs> we're all anticipating that. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea just for posterity and for my own sanity to kind of try and recap uh, my general sense of Elden Ring's story at this point. Hey Cosmos, nice to see you here. Autumn, Assailant. So, um, so I wrote up this, this document yesterday and uh, I was going to like try and recap the entire story, but of course <laughs> it ended up being... Uh, there's a lot there's a lot to recap so i only got up essentially to the war with the giants so uh, missing a lot of stuff so when we get there um well we'll see what happens but basically i'm just going to read through this and uh sort of read comments and um and uh, see what you guys think and just sort of try and recap everything so um Disclaimer, I have left out a decent amount of couching and waffling about speculation and alternative explanations and stuff. The sort of things which I'm usually pretty careful about in my videos, which is why this is a stream and not a video. Um, so in any case, treat everything that follows with extreme skepticism. This is just a description of where my views stand at the moment. So if I state anything with too much confidence, it's more an expression of my sense of the story rather than what is most parsimonious or the most strongly supported by the text. And uh, yes, caveat emptor, buyers beware. So don't, um, don't, uh, if I say state something very strongly, don't um, necessarily think that that means that's the only interpretation or that that's the, even the most, um, the most reasonable interpretation in some sense. Oh, hey, Sordier. Nice to see you back. And Grape Ape. Um, and hello, Monofish. Okay, so first, just a little narrative overview here. So broadly speaking, there are a few major themes in Elden Ring. Obviously, duality, life and death, fate and free will, the continuity of life and legacy, uh, duty and subservience to higher powers, the allure and power of blind faith, the rejection or integration of opposing worldviews, the virtues or faults which characterize a leader, and of course the nature of identity and understanding which go hand in hand. Like in previous games, these themes are expressed through a particular brand of storytelling, a particular style, which has roots in both Japanese media and Western religious, mythical, or occult uh, texts in which poetic devices and metaphors are given literal representation in the story. So a good example of this is the gaping dragon from Dark Souls. The gaping dragon is this creature which sits at the bottom of this whole biosphere of the sewers. And so all the different, you know, there's there's uh, hollows and rats and slimes and, and so on and so forth. As you go down the levels and it becomes more and more disgusting and gross and all the little remnants of, of meat and... Uh, and you know, food for these, these, uh, carrion feeders in a sense. Um, it sort of travels down the sewers and at the very bottom of it lies the gaping dragon. And so the gaping dragon is this like gluttonous, disgusting gluttonous beast. And so the way that it's visually represented is it's nothing but a giant mouth, essentially. So the, the reason that it's nothing but a giant mouth is not because you know, it evolved that way exactly. It's just that's sort of the literal representation of 
this metaphor, which is the thing that the, the giant, the mouth that eats everything at the bottom, right? So, um, uh, so that's the basic context for Miyazaki's storytelling. That's the way that he likes to tell stories. You, if you figure out the metaphor, um, then you figure out what the, to some degree, what the mechanics are, because the, the literal aspect of the world is based on the metaphors. So the metaphors are there first, and then that's given this like literal diegetic context in the world. Okay, so that's all I'm saying there. Uh, the central message or worldview expressed is roughly the same or a variation of that which appeared in previous games. Attachment fetters the subject and suffocates its object. And that's, you know, that's often represented, well, in, in various forms, but like one classic representation is you have the character who becomes an enormous beast with a giant arm because the giant arm is like they're grasping for something. So the the way that they reach out in, desi in desire to grasp something is, again, that metaphor is literally represented by them having a giant arm. And so that's, it's, you know... Uh, it's Manus, it's um, uh, the Cleric Beast, it's, um, what else? Is it a Demon of Hatred, I think, also has that. Um, so, uh, classic example of this kind of metaphor. Um, but this is an important message, is that, like, you become too attached to something, and the person... Um, the person who becomes too attached to something, who desires something too greatly, uh, this consumes them. That maybe that's a better way than than saying that it fetters them. It consumes them. The the desire consumes them, and it also suffocates the object of its desire. In many cases, okay. So that's one idea. Um, another idea is the world is made of binaries, which naturally achieve balance sometimes through violent swings of the pendulum, so be wary of the consequences of gripping too tightly to one side. This is basically all of the stories are about this, that, um, and it's sort of, it, it, this is really just a variation of what I just explained previously. So it's the same idea um, uh, of being too attached to something and being consumed by that. And then, but there's, there's a, a broader idea, which is that, everything is is there's a sort of natural state of of balance in the world and balance is not necessarily a good thing it just means um because there's a balance between good and evil and so you know anything that's it, balance itself is not good it's just that's a fact of the world is that everything is in dualities is in binaries and so if you if you try to promote one side too strongly and you you sort of evade or try to escape the other side of it, then you're going to be slapped in the face by reality because that pendulum swing is going to be much more violent proportional to the way that you uh, promote one side of the, you know, the first side. So that, that's an important theme as well. Um, and also, I think this is a bit of a subtler message, but I think it's present in all of the, uh, in all of the stories uh, to some degree. And this is an important part of why uh, linking the flame is the most is the right ending in Dark Souls. Uh, that despite the inescapable tragedy of the world, it's still worth it to absurdly defy entropy and pursue legacy and continuity as long as it's done wisely. As in other words, as long as you are. Uh, as long as you have a full understanding, a full acceptance of the state of the world, which is in these binaries, and you don't try to um, uh, reject one side of a binary system, then it's still worth it to um, sort of defy tragedy. Uh, so there's something along those lines. That's the sort of basic underlying message of really all of Miyazaki's stories, but I'm talking about Elden Ring now, so... Okay. Um, yeah, Kate, you're exactly right. The uh, Godric grasping with all his fingers, it's the same idea of, of, the, of Manus and, um, and Lawrence. 
Um, it, it's a little bit different, but but yeah, same basic theme. Okay, the game focuses on Merica as the latest iteration of the flawed leader trope, more so than in previous iterations of this type of story. In particular, her motivations in psychology, as well as that of her children, or other aspects of her, such as Radigan and Malekith, which narratively is also a way to inform about her. So, you know, Radigan is Merica. Spoilers. Um, and so everything that we say about Radigan in some way informs us about Merica, informs us about her psychology, informs us about who she is. And Malekith is Merica's shadow, which, I mean, that's a literal term from Jungian psychology to talk about the darker side of someone. So regardless of what the, you know, the, the actual in-game context is for, for what exactly those things mean, in narrative terms, talking about Radigan and Malekith is a way of informing us about Merica. And I think compared to the previous games, you know, Merica is much more the central focus of this story than, than Gwyn was, or than King Alant was, or than, uh, who would it be? I guess Lawrence, Lawrence and Wilhelm, um, or... You know, in Sekiro, it's really more Genichiro than it is Ishin. Um, although Ishin is inside Genichiro, so I don't know what's going on there. Uh, so, but but the, the point is that, like, that trope of the leader who has some kind of flaw, who is driven and but but causes problems in the world because they are so clinging to one ideology... Um, that's, that's Merica in this, in this story, but there's much more exploration of who Merica is. There's much more focus, uh, and elaboration on who she is. So, um, that's an interesting difference, I think, between Elden Ring and the previous stories. Yes, Cosmos uploaded a great video. I, I really uh, enjoyed watching that. Everybody should uh, check that out. Cosmos did a, a video on America. So, um, I don't. I don't know if I agree with everything in it, but uh, there's some great, great ideas in there. So everyone should check that out. Um, finally, the game describes a world affected by fundamental processes, the nature of which are hinted at by the laws of causality and regression in two ways. So this this binary of causality and regression is this this underlying I don't know if that itself is the underlying theme, but but it sort of it speaks to the underlying theme here um in, in a couple of different ways. First, as a process of division and recombination, so things being pulled apart and things being put together. Um uh, separation of a single whole into multiple different aspects and multiple things being sort of converging, coalescing into one thing. Um, in both a literal sense and a more psychological sense, um, again, with the Jungian analogy, you know, the process of individuation is basically that you have all these different components uh, in your mind, different archetypes. Um, you know, the, the, the classic one being the, the shadow, the anima, uh, and that you need to, in order to individuate yourself, you need to find a way to integrate these psychological components and and become a sort of whole person. Um, but but it, this also happens literally in the story. And again, it's the idea of taking the metaphor and making it literal. Um, this binary system of causality and regression also plays out in the sense of a process of linear sequence and reversion. So moving along a chain of events, literally causality, and regression to an earlier state. So it's important that these these two things are not exactly the same idea, but the law of causality the laws of causality and regression can be sort of taken to mean both of these things. It's both the right the pool between meanings and the pool of meaning. So uh, you know, solve et coagula as I've talked about in in the alchemical worldview, uh, division and recombination. Um, and also this linear sense of moving forward along a chain of causality and, rever and reverting to a previous state along a linear chain of causality. Um, and this second interpretation establishes a cyclical framework for events in the narrative. 
which is very confusing a lot of the time. These processes take place on various stages, both literal and metaphorical. Yes, okay. So the cyclical framework, along with cultural cross-pollination, which is really an example of this division recombination idea, make certain parts of the lore exceptionally difficult to place in context because it creates ambiguity around whether A caused B or B caused A, or whether A came before B, or A is actually C reverting to A, or whether C is entirely separate from A, but it adopted and absorbed aspects of A. So in other words, when you look at any culture or any practice or anything that sort of, um, you know, if you, if you try to, let's say, put things in a timeline, you look at something and you go, well, this is similar to this, but we don't know if, is that a direct, is there a direct chain of causality leading from this one thing to the, to the next? Or is it simply this, this aspect of sort of reverting to a prior state? And so this complicates the, any analysis of the timeline and the plot, because it's very hard to know, you know, is there, are we talking about one thing or are we talking about the same concept expressed at different points in time? Um, that's a bit confusing, but I think, I hope I made myself clear what that means. Yeah, Killer King points out, I uh, love how in Elden Ring, ideologies take literal physical form, or rather the other way around. And Assailant points out that Demon Souls also has a similar thing where people's beliefs are given physical form as demons. Um, yes, and, and it's actually, maybe to a lesser extent, also present in, in Bloodborne and in, in Dark Souls, uh, or, but in slightly different ways. But I think this has always been the the magic system in Miyazaki's worlds is always a narrative device which is playing out that what I talked about of taking a metaphor and making it literal. There's different ways that it that it happens in the you know in terms of the details of how that works, but basically that magic you know the supernatural element of the world is always something which allows metaphors, uh, which allows this sort of poetic imagery to be a real part of the world instead of just metaphor or poetic imagery. Okay, so we're, we'll start on the timeline. Um, we, like I said, I only really go up to the end of the war with the giants. So we'll, we'll see how far we get because uh, I don't have that long. So I'm, I'm going to try and get through this quickly, but... Um, if, if you have any burning questions, ask them, and I will try and answer as we go along. Okay, so we start with section one, Before the Erd Tree, um, part A, in the beginning. So, although we are clearly meant to distrust the Three Fingers, I don't believe that Hayata is lying about the facts of what sounds like a creation myth. Now, you could argue whether it is a creation myth, but she seems to be expressing a creation myth that she um, was told by the Three Fingers. And I think, although the Three Fingers are, tr are untrustworthy, I don't think that the facts are untrustworthy. So I'd make a distinction between facts and value judgments. So I don't see a narrative reason to include a straight-up lie in this case because, at least for, for one reason being that, this is the only context we get around this event. So, you know, why include something that's just false? Um, although, of course, we could be missing context. Okay, so in the beginning... Oh, yeah, and, and I would compare this to... I don't doubt Kath's telling of history in Dark Souls, even though I distrust his agenda, right? Um, I think that everything he says is right, but I don't necessarily... That doesn't necessarily mean the conclusions are correct. So Hayata tells this story and then she says it's a mistake. I would say that the story is probably true. The idea that it's a mistake is a value judgment. Um, so if we take it to be true, then that means in the beginning everything was unified. The one great, in my view, is not an entity or God. It's just a state of the world. It's just one giant whole everything is one 
in this oneness exists the greater will, because the greater will divides it, so the greater will has to exist in that one whole. And the greater will is exactly what the name suggests. It is a will. It's just will. It's not a creature. It's not um, a god, exactly. Although it depends on how you define that. Um, but I think it's just will. Um, I would say it is, by analogy, it is the anima mundi, or the world soul. It is the consciousness of the universe, the divine mover, the essence of existence. It is essentially God in the sort of monotheistic view of God, um, or rather the, maybe the, the deist view of God. Um, something that's a bit more abstract than, you know, old guy with a beard. Uh, it's just this sort of will of the universe. Um, one, one point I make here is that it's also possible that the one great is the greater will. So one translation of the Japanese, it's, it's literally great oneness or great one. Um, Okina Hidotsu, I think is how it's written. Um, that could just be an epithet for greater will, which is, uh, Okinawa Ishii, I think. So it could just be like the great one. That's the, that is the greater will. Um, that's a bit of a crazy idea, but, um, uh, oh, thank you, Grape Ape. I appreciate it. Um, so the greater will, um, is... The greater will divides everything, which allows for a cycle of life to emerge. And let me explain what I mean by that. Separating out births and souls from the one implies several things. So births mean that there is continuity in generations of life. If you have births, presumably, now there's a sort of imp implied axiom here, which is that you cannot create something from nothing. If, if everything is one, then everything comes from that one. If you have births, it means that you have to have, you're creating new life, which means that it's not, you know, energy is only transferred. It's, it's, uh, it's never added or subtracted. So, and I think this holds true for the, the cosmology. So if there's new births, that means that the births have to come from somewhere. Um, in other words, I think this also implies the, the beginning of physical death. Uh, in order to have new births and still remain constant with all the matter and energy in the universe, you have to have death. So this implies a, a generation, uh, you know, multiple generations of life, which means a cycle of life. Things die, you know, things give birth and they die. Um... This also implies that whatever the outer god rot is, which is rot is the cycle of death and rebirth, um, it's either something which was created at the beginning of time, and I would say this is the beginning of time because if everything is one, you cannot have causality. Um, there can be no relationship with, between anything, so you can't have time. Uh, so rot is either created at the beginning of time or it's at least something which exemplifies a process which was created at the beginning of time. Um, let me just read a couple comments here. Um, Mana Fish. I don't believe that the one great is symbolized by the five fingers. I think the five fingers is a later development, which I will get into in just a little bit. Um, I think one, one thing which I would say here is that when we look at the pre-Erd Tree history, I think the time scale, you have to imagine a way, way bigger time scale, right? Um, even when we go back to like the War with the Giants, we go back to the Ancient Dragons, I think that everything that happens, let's say, from the War with the Giants to the present, is probably something on the order of, you know, thousands of years but whatever that really means in the context of El Elden Ring. But going back from there to like the beginning of creation, I think we have to imagine something on the order of millions of years, that there's lots and lots of events happening um, 
that are are separated by like that these eras even though we get very little information about anything that's just a facet of us sort of being in the present and looking backwards that we shouldn't condense that period into an equivalent period of time based on how much information we get about things near to the present in other words like if we get 10 item descriptions talking about the the time between the shattering of the Elden Ring and today, um, and we get 10 item descriptions talking about uh, the very beginning of of the universe or, or, you know, prior to the Erd Tree or something like this, that doesn't mean that those are equivalent lengths of time. We just have much less information about the early days. So I think that we have to kind of imagine that the time scale is way 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 bigger in these early days so lots of different things can happen and be maintained and, and develop a system you know an order or whatever um in these early days and maintain that for you know could be thousands could be millions of years before it changes even if we only get you know one reference to it or something like this um Yes, I agree. Unusual box. There's a lot of, um, at least parallels to Kabbalah. I mean, the tree of life being the, the clear one. And, and also, I mean, the basic idea of the tree of life is like, um, this concept of the one that is two. And that's why everything is, is like a, a trinity because everything is one. And, and e even as you go down the tree of life, like, uh, the different emanations, it's, um, each one is sort of this, the expression of the same idea that the one is two and, and there, and from that you get the three. Um, where was I? So mentioning souls. So we, we get the separation of births and souls from the one, um, Mentioning souls in addition to births also implies that there is something immortal beyond physical life and death. Um, and so we already have a distinction between a physical and spiritual type of existence. So if we have births, I believe that implies that we also have deaths. And then that means that we have births and deaths and we also have souls. So why would you need a soul if life is just physical and we have births and, and deaths. So I think, I believe this means that we have already a duality of existence in which there's a spiritual kind of existence and a physical type of existence. Um, the separation of souls from the one, this is a bit more speculative, but the separation of souls from the one would most intuitively be seen as the separation of the greater will itself, the animating force divided and split into different life forms. And, um, I think this is a, a a fairly universal concept across a variety of myths and religions in which, and 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 philosophies in which, uh, the soul is sort of an expression of the divine whole. It's a it's a piece of the divine whole. This is the idea, especially in Buddhism, um, which doesn't really believe in souls in the same way that, um, uh, well, okay. The, in Buddhism, you have the concept of anatta, which is no self. Um, so basically the idea is if you examine, you know, if you introspect and you examine what is inside your mind, you will find that there is no thinker behind the thought. Thoughts just occur to you. The things that happen, the mental processes in your mind um, and the actions that you take, well, the actions that you take are, are the result of, of processes in your mind. Um, and also in your body because you have reflexes and so on. But, um, but basically that the thoughts just occur to you, um, you're, you are not creating the thoughts. And so Buddhism is a lot of Buddhism, let's say there's different branches, whatever Mahayana is maybe the most popular, but, um, if you, if you introspect, if you examine your internal processes, then you find that there is no self. Um, there is nothing that is doing the thinking, right? And so it's this meditation on this is basically what leads you to enlightenment. And enlightenment is essentially the understanding, um, that you are, you don't exist, which is anatta. That's no self. Um, 
And I always thought that was funny in relation to Japanese because anata in Japanese means you. Uh, so there's a bit of a pun there maybe. But, um, um, but in Buddhism, there's also the idea of reincarnation. Uh, so, you know, if you don't become enlightened in this lifetime, then you will come back and you will maybe become enlightened in the next life or the life after that. And eventually when you become enlightened, you are no longer going to be reincarnated. So what does that mean exactly? Because if your body dies and there is no self, then what is it that's reincarnated? And basically it's this idea of, um, well, there's a bunch of ideas there, but basically it's the idea that, that everything is part of one, the great, great whole unity of existence. And therefore, if you believe in a self, you're sort of tied to um, something which is conditional and transient. And therefore, you're sort of <laughs> you sort of the illusion of self grounds you to existence. Whereas if you become enlightened and you realize there is no self, then you're not going to reincarnate because you are part of the, the whole unity of existence. Yeah, endless reincarnation is not seen as a good thing in Buddhism. Exactly. So um, reincarnation is like the, you are trapped because life is suffering. Uh, life is dukkha. So all life is suffering. Therefore, reincarnation is not a good thing because you're just going to suffer more. The path to enlightenment leads you out of reincarnation. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked here. But the point is that um, if we have some kind of spiritual type of existence which transcends beyond physical life and death, it would make sense to connect that to the greater will or this this great wholeness of existence, the, the consciousness of the universe or whatever, um, I think, thematically. The Japanese confuses this a bit more, and we've actually... Um, I should mention now that anyone who is not in the Discord, I uh, join the Discord. Um, it, it's in the description. You can join up. We've been having a fun discussion um, sometimes heated, sometimes uh, a little bit tismy, but um, we've been having a good discussion about um, exactly what souls and spirits and spirit bodies and all these sort of things, all these distinctions are um, in the Discord. So I think there's a lot of ambiguity there. Um, and I would say that in this case, the, the word which is translated as soul is actually kokoro, which is a completely different one because we have uh, tamashi and um, reikon and reikai as well. Um, so it's a little bit un unclear. Kokoro is um, maybe more aptly translated as heart or mind. Um, so who knows exactly what this means? Um, there's a lot of inconsistencies with how these words are translated. So, for example, in D's armor set, it translates Ishi, which is usually translated as will, as in the greater will. That's the same word, Ishi. Um, it translates that as mind. Um, but I think, let's say, for example, when it says that uh, Radigan left and, and Rinala's heart went with him, that is Kokoro. So that's the word that's being used here. Um, so exactly what that is, is a bit debatable. Um, so all of this sort of theorizing about the cosmology uh, it, it may not lead anywhere. There's, there's enough ambiguity in exactly what all these things mean that I don't... Um, I can't say anything confidently there. I would say that in general, the idea of again, the, the sort of tripartite model of existence, that there is a physical type of existence, and then there is a mental world of your memories and thoughts and so on, and then there is also your piece of the divine whole. I think that that model has a lot of basis in myth and, and in alchemy and in different occult traditions. Um... So I sort of lean towards that model of of existence um, in Elden Ring because I think that would it would just makes the most sense. Um, even uh, like the philosopher Karl Popper talked about uh, world worlds one, two, and three. World one being the the 
and this is completely a non-religious view. This is a just philosophy uh, discussion that uh, basically world one is the physical world of, you know, atoms and, and physical processes, chemistry and all this stuff. Um, world two is the world of thoughts and, and memories, mental processes. And then world three is this other thing. Um, this is slightly different than what I was talking about, but, but in his view, world three was essentially the world of logic and rules. The best way to express this and to distinguish it from the other two worlds is if you imagine, um, if you imagine, let's say, uh, well, let's take Elden Ring. So, uh, Elden Ring physically exists, right? And there is all the thoughts of the developers and their understanding of what works in the games and what, uh, what all the players understand. You can imagine that, let's take something like, um, how many hits does it take to kill Malekith with, um, I don't know, with the grafted dragon um, on a level one character. I don't know if anyone's tested that. But the point is, let's just imagine that no one has actually tested that and that the developers don't really know. That is a fact. There is a truth to that, which is based on logic. And so Popper sort of views this as that's the world of rules, that we don't actually create the world of rules in terms of thinking it up. We actually discover things in the world of rules, which I think this is very applicable to Elden Ring because it is all about this sort of existence of abstract concepts. Um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked, so I'm going to keep on going. Um, the initial act of division, the greater will separated out these births and souls. And I say separated. It's actually interesting because the Japanese um, is, uh, what is it? Is it Wakaru? It's a word which is, you know, a lot of Japanese is very ambiguous, and I'm not saying I'm an uh, 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 an expert on Japanese, but there's a lot of sort of context dependent stuff in Japanese, which makes it more ambiguous than than English. And this word, like, there's the word waka, um, which is uh, uh, the the idea of understanding something so for, for example wakarimas you know it means i understand but it actually and i believe it comes from the same root i think this is right um someone could correct me if i'm wrong here but it basically comes from the idea of like dividing something and so there's this idea that understanding is based on uh division and separation so in this case um it is the greater will is separating out the one but you could also say that it's sort of understanding itself. That would be a kind of poetic interpretation. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, a native Japanese speaker might might uh, have a more clear understanding of uh, of this, but um, but that's sort of an interesting implication there. Um, in any case, this initial act of division and the way that the three fingers frame this as a mistake implies that the greater will is affiliated with order as opposed to chaos. But it might not be that simple. The existence of a binary between order and chaos is already a kind of meta order, something that's pointed out in the Eternal Champion series, which Miyazaki has stated was a source of inspiration for Elden Ring, that basically, you know, you have this great battle between order and chaos, or in, in the Eternal Champion series, it's chaos and law, um, but, you know, order and chaos, but the fact that you already have this binary, like a binary itself, implies a kind of order, and therefore uh, chaos is always subsidiary to order, that there's always a greater meta order um, that's, that's greater than order itself, uh, which determines that there is a binary between order and chaos. Um, and I would say in this case, possibly subservient, and what I mean by that is that the three fingers are obviously pro chaos, um, but we also have the two fingers, and it's 
I would say strongly implied that at one point we had the five fingers. And so if the greater will is something that exists at the very beginning of time, um, it may be that it is not necessarily pro order at all, or at least that in the way that it's pro order, chaos is also part of that order. So that's a little bit confusing, but I, I think the ambiguity is warranted. Okay, part B. Um, primeval and primordial. So the word primeval... Oh, whoops. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, the word primeval uh, comes from prime, which means first. The evil part comes from the same word... Uh, the same root as the word evity uh, is in longevity. So longevity means, you know, long, long life, um, uh, long existence, let's say. Uh, so primeval basically means first age, first existence, right? So by its name and context, the primeval current could be placed at this incredibly early period, at the very beginning of the universe. However, a current implies directionality, which means that it couldn't be the one great, right? The one great, if everything is one, there can be no cause and effect, there can be no time, there can be no progression, because everything is one. Like, in order to progress, you need to go from A to B. And if there's A and B, that means they're not one. So, in order to have a current, it has to be after the one great. Um, now, the Japanese uh, is actually, doesn't say anything about primeval, and the word current is more like source waters, source or headwaters, something like this. It's, it's how you describe like the, the beginning of a river or something like this. Uh, so, it's, it's more like source of magic or the headwaters of sorcery. Um, but that also, I would say, has this idea of directionality. If you have a source, then you have something which flows from the source, which means that you have multiple things and not one thing. Um, the absence of a word denoting time period might mean that this is not, the primeval current is not something at this early age at all. So who knows exactly what's going on there? I would also say it's possible that the greater will is itself the primeval current and that its initial creation of births and souls is the creation of some kind of star of light. Um, so, uh, later on I'm going to mention Selin's dialogue about the different kinds of life and glintstone and amber of the cosmos and, and all that. But I would say that clearly the stars do contain some kind of life. We have, you know, stars impact the lands between, and we get beasts that are stars and beasts that are uh, come from stars and, and lords and all sorts of things. So there is life in the stars. Um, Selen actually says that we are children of the stars and that, uh, you know, the whole point of the uh, study of the primeval current is to fashion sorcerers into the seeds of stars. So the idea of birthing new stars. So it's possible that the initial creation of, of births and souls has nothing to do with like humans or beasts or anything like this. It's not necessarily like a Garden of Eden situation. It could be that there is, uh, you know, a more, let's say, primeval, uh, primal um, kind of existence, um, which exists just as star life. And the greater will could be the primeval current, because if it is the source of magic, if it is the uh, this sort of beginning of... of star life um, that would kind of line up with the, the way that the greater will is separating births and souls and it would also line up with the general sense of like well order is coming um, in the sense of causality in the sense of you know division of things and, and progression from one to another um, and then we have the word primordial and primordial also basically means the same thing as primeval it means first thing the prime order. Um, in many places, this is just an English edition. So the Japanese text does not, where we see the word primordial, sometimes that's just, there's nothing in the Japanese text. It doesn't use that word at all. Um, it doesn't even have a replacement for that. It's just, they just added that in. But there is a Japanese word which roughly means the same thing. It means primordial. 
Um, although it could also potentially mean just original or just early even. So it's, again, Japanese is a bit more ambiguous, um, so not a lot of help there. And primordial is used to describe the crucible. I think that's the only time it's used, is to describe the crucible. So the crucible, we could put that very, very early on. That would make sense. Now, in the present, as I mentioned, we have many aliens arriving via falling stars. We have Estelle, the falling star beasts, and we have, you know, the Alabaster and Onyx Lords coming in through these portals um, at star craters. Um, so that implies that if the Crucible is something which is specific to the lands between, it is not the source of all life in the universe. However, it's also possible that the Crucible once existed outside the lands between, or that it still exists outside of the lands between. So the Crucible might not be something which is unique to the lands between it may be something which um affected the lands between but is not is not um locked here let's say um and uh, when you look at Estelle and the falling star beasts they have these incongruous features you know like the falling star beasts have these uh, hoofs and and a scorpion tail and and weird pincers and uh, made of rock uh, Estelle has like a human skull, but with a single eye, and and it's got dragonfly wings and all all this stuff, which seems thematically related to the Crucible in that it's sort of these incongruous features blended together. So I believe that the most compelling answer to the question of the Crucible is that the Crucible, and I should point out that the the Japanese Rutsubo does not have all these extra connotations that they do that it does in English, or at least not to the same degree. It means very literally a crucible, and a crucible is a, a vessel in which you melt metals, usually, um, in order to forge something or smith something. So it's a it's a melting pot, is basically what it means. So I think the crucible is just the term for the state of indivisible life essence before it formed into anything worth mentioning, and that it is in fact the source of all life, or it was. But that because we have the law of regression in action, the crucible, or the conditions whereby it is defined as such, can exist again and again and again. So in other words, if the crucible is the state uh, of life, it's a certain state of life in which everything is sort of formless and, and mixed together, then uh, you can have the crucible be the source of all life, the beginning, and also the crucible can return again and again as long as you just blend life together. So it could be the source of life in the universe, and it could be the primordial form of the Erd Tree and the lands between specifically, and it could be the golden star sent by the greater will, or the result of the golden star sent by the greater will, and it could be something the misbegotten made contact with all at once, while not necessarily being sort of present throughout the timeline consistently, if that makes sense. Uh, the crucible could even be the one great or the greater will, because if we have this idea of oneness of life, then, okay, this is a very similar idea. So, in summary, so far, I find it completely plausible, although I'm not necessarily persuaded by this, that the greater will, the one great, the primordial crucible of life, and the primeval current, or source of magic, could all be one and the same thing. Although, given the context I've already established of, of the themes of binaries and confused identities, I find it even more plausible to say that they're all the same thing, but also different things at the same time. So, that clears everything up. Um, let me just read a couple comments here. Salem points out that the that also lines up with the possibility that founding reign of stars and Elden stars were part of the same event. Again, going back to what I said about this um, regression and causality causing confusion in the lore because we have potentially a cyclical framework, they may not be the same event, but, a, but the same idea expressed at different points in time. Uh, so that's also a possibility. But... Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, I really, um, I completely, as I wrote all of this, I didn't write anything about the astrologers. So that's one part that I just completely missed out, even though 
I, it should fit into this part of the timeline. Not not this part of the timeline necessarily, but but the timeline that I've written so far. Um, Christopher Lepensi says, I usually like viewing the plot of Elden Ring as allegorical to our own history, and so the one great is our origin point, a condensed ball of matter which expanded into our current universe. Yeah. You know... From that perspective, there's a very interesting theory proposed by Sir Roger Penrose called cosmic... Wait, what is it? Cyclic... Cyclic cosmology? Conformal cyclic cosmo cosmology. CCC, I remember that. Um, and it's basically the idea that the universe is infinite, and what happens is it expands and expands, because we know the universe is expanding. It expands and expands to the point, and, it, and basically entropy takes over, you get this dark era, it's literally called the dark era, where there's only black holes left in the universe, and then also those dissipate over, you know, trillions and quadrillions of years. And there's basically nothing left um, besides a few particles. It's just particles floating around um, in the expanded universe. And what he proposes is that essentially the universe then has no way to measure itself, and so it forgets what size it is, which sounds very maybe anthropomorphic and, and weird, but um, there's math to explain it, which I can't make sense of, um, but basically says that the universe forgets what size it is, and so it becomes essentially a single point, and then that sort of becomes the next big bang of the of the next stage of the universe, so that this is a, a, a cosmic cycle, um, which is kind of fun to think about um, while we're on these topics of cosmology. Um, Tiamat also has five heads in Sumerian mythology. That's interesting um, because Placidusex had five heads according to the model. So that's interesting. Puzzleheaded asks what the formless mother is the mother of exactly. Well, she is the mother of truth. Um, I will mention the formless mother. I think the formless mother is just the crucible actually, but um, oh, is Tiamat having five heads just D&D &D lore? I'd be interested about that. I don't know much. I know a little bit about Tiamat and um, about Marduk and a couple of those gods, but I don't, I'm, I'm not really familiar with. I don't even know, is, is Gilgamesh, is that part of the same mythos or is that a, a later thing? I, I, that's something I need to... Um, I need to explore a bit more. Okay, moving on to part C. And this is prehistory. So we had primeval and primordial, and we had the beginning of time. And uh, now we move on to prehistory. And this involves dragons in the ancient dynasty. At least this part does. Um, so the ancient dragons ruled in prehistoric times, and the Japanese makes that pretty explicit, um, before the Erd tree. And, and it's mentioned several times that they ruled in prehistoric times. Um, which is, in a sense, an oxymoron, because we know of many things that happened before the Erd Tree, so it isn't prehistory as far as we're concerned, because we're reading item descriptions. Um, so some of the things that happened before the Erd Tree that we know from item descriptions are that Placidus X was Elden Lord, Beasts gained intelligence, Altus Blooms were funereal, um... And I've translated the Japanese there as death-sending flowers. It's a bit weird the way that it's phrased. Um, we know that death was burned in ghost flame. And the civilizations of the Ul slash Uld and possibly even the Eternal flourished. All of this happened before the Erd Tree, according to item descriptions. Um, and on that last point, it's not entirely clear whether the description means both the Ul slash Uld and the Eternal flourished. It says, this is the from the map, um, that it says the the, what is it, the area between the Shifra and Insul rivers uh, is the grave of civilizations that flourished before the Erd Tree. Now, the Japanese does not specify singular or plural for civilization. So the English says civilizations, plural. Um, we don't know whether that means... I think the English would imply both the Ul slash Uld ancient dynasty and the Eternal, but it's also possible that the Ul and the Uld are different civilizations, which I know is um, maybe a reach, 
um, but it's a possibility. Now, besides this, because this um, this the map is describing what it is currently. It is currently the grave of civilizations that flourished before the Erdtree. Uh, the other item descriptions all have this Toyu, um, it is said, addendum. Uh, so it's marked as hearsay, as uh, Last Protagonist puts it, um, which I think solves the oxymoron because it is prehistory. We know about it only through hearsay, essentially. So that solves the oxymoron, but I also don't see a good reason to distrust the information. So I don't see, like, I don't think it's reasonable to discount an item description because of the hearsay marker, unless there is a very strong reason to do so. Um, that alone, I think, you know, why would you put in something which is false? Um, it, the reason that you write a story is to communicate ideas and, you know, maybe, maybe there is misdirection but i think we have to operate as if there is not really that any misdirection is that exists in the game is purposeful uh i don't think the intention is to lie to you in order to mislead you it might mislead you by context um but i don't think it's I don't think there's an attempt to lie to you from the authors, right? The people in the game might lie. That's a different thing. So I think that, you know, if there's an item description and we don't have any other context besides this item description and it says, uh, this is hearsay, I still believe it's true. It may mean that we're missing context about it, but I, I believe it's, um, uh, I don't, I don't believe there's a good reason to discount it. Um, well, partly because the narrator is not a character in the game, right? It's not even like I would distrust the intro narrator before I distrust the item description narrator. Um, because the intro narrator says that uh, he calls the lands between our home, which sort of implies that he is a character almost. Um I don't think it really does, but um, but I would say that there's more of a reason to distrust that narrator than the narrator of the item descriptions. I believe the item descriptions are correct. Now, they could be technically correct in that it is true that it is said about these things and that people who are saying it could be false. But I think, again, I think you need a stronger support for the idea to discount it um, you know, supports from somewhere else to discount it. So I think on the face of it, they should be accepted as true. Um, this would imply that assuming one can only be Elden Lord with the Elden Ring existing, the Elden Stars event, which is the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring, took place pre prehistory, as in before Placidus X became Elden Lord. So Placidus X was Elden Lord in the prehistoric era of the ancient dragons before the Erd Tree. And that means that if he was Elden Lord, that means that the Elden Ring, the Elden Star, the Elden Beast, must have arrived in the lands between before uh, that event. It must have happened much, much earlier. Now, there's, there is one uh, other possible interpretation there, which is that Faramazula was never in the lands between in the first place, but I don't think that's likely. Now, in the past, I've pointed out that the Elden Beast becoming the Elden Ring could be seen as a kind of taking on the role rather than literal one-to-one -one transformation. In other words, that the Elden Beast became the Elden Ring. It doesn't necessarily mean that the Elden Beast transformed into the Elden Ring. It could mean that the Elden Ring already existed in some form and the Elden Beast became... Like, the Elden Ring is mm, a concept that existed, and the Elden Beast became the thing which embodied that concept. Something along those lines. That's a possible interpretation. Um, I don't think that's likely. Um, because the Elden Ring... Part, partly because, okay, the Elden Ring clearly represents something on the Order side of the Order Chaos duality. So... 
the Elden Beast is the living incarnation of order, so that would line up, you know, living incarnation of order. What else? How can you have it become the Elden Ring unless the Elden Ring is also... Like, it just doesn't... It doesn't really come together as well. And we don't have any information about any kind of order before the dragons. So if the Elden Ring existed before Placidus X was Elden Lord... You know, okay, then we have to assume that there's something else which was like Elden Lord before that, or there was some kind of order before that, and we don't have any information about that. So I don't think I don't think this is likely. Now it's also possible that Placidus X was Elden Lord by virtue of being conjoined with or a consort to the Elden Beast itself prior to the Elden Beast transformation. And I would say that, you know, the description it says that. Um, the greater will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring, does not say that it immediately became the Elden Ring. So it could be that there was some time before it became the Elden Ring. So Placidus X could be Elden Lord um, by being conjoined or by being wed in some way to the Elden Beast. Um, and then later on, the Elden Beast became the Elden Ring. And so that kind of um, that could also be a potential solution to the whole thing about Godfrey being first Elden Lord. He could be first Elden Lord of the Elden Ring, whereas Placidus X could be Elden Lord of the Elden Beast. Which is not, it's a bit of a messy solution, but it's a possibility. Um, yeah, so in this sense we might see the Elden Beast as Placidus X's god who fled. Perhaps the fleeing, you know, Elden Beast and Placidus X are conjoined in the way that Merica and Radigan are conjoined as Lord and God. Um, Elden Beast flees, uh, Elden Beast being a god, and, and when you kill the Elden Beast, it says God slain, although it's unclear exactly what that means. Um, so the Elden Beast could be a god. So maybe Pla he was at Placidus X's god, and, he, and it fled, and then it, as it fled, you know, in that same event, it became the Elden Ring. That's a possibility. So, we don't really have a lot of context about this. So it's all a bit speculative. Uh, yeah, and I mean, also, yeah, as, as uh, Simone Alcazar points out, I think it's interesting that the Elden Beast is very similar to the Ancient Dragons, with even being one of the third enemies that breathes golden fire, um, including Placidus X and the Ulcerated Tree Spirit. The Ulcerated Tree Spirit is obviously connected to the Erd Tree, which, you know, the Elden Beast has an Erd Tree on its tail, essentially. Um, and it has, it has two sets of wings, right? Like the Ancient Dragons, it has a very draconic look to it. Um, and it breathes golden fire in the way that Placidus X does, although obviously there's slight differences between them. So, yes, I think this is a possibility. Okay, the seat of the Dragon Lord, Placidus X, is currently outside of time, whatever currently means. But I believe it is self-evident that Faramazula was not always a ruin floating in the sky, and therefore its situation regarding time is also suspect. I think it is as obvious as could be that Faramazula was at one point in the middle of the lands between. I think that, to me, this is just... Um, I mean, I know that there is no uh, clear textual support for that idea, but I just... Uh, it, it makes too much sense, like... You can even see there's like there's like trees and, and soil and roots at the bottom of, of Faramazula. Um, you have all these ruins uh, in a particular, you know, on the edges of, of Limgrave and Liurnia. I think it's clear that the Faramazula was part of... And then you have problems with like how the, the Draconic Tree Sentinel or the uh, Worm Faces are there and things like this. I think it's clear that it was once in the middle of the lands between, or at least, if not in the middle, then um, finishing out the ring in between Kaled and uh, the mountaintops of the giants, and also the architecture in, in the Bestial Sanctum is clearly Faramazula inspired, so all, all of that just seems 
um, too clear. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute it, even though I know there's no strong textual support for that idea. I think it's just self-evident. Um, so if it was once attached and then it was displaced in space, it's likely that this same event also displaced it in time. Um, so while I believe a compelling case can be made for this displacement event to be the shattering of the Elden Ring, I don't feel particularly strongly about when it happened, uh, when it was displaced. I just think, I think it's clear that it was displaced. I, th I don't think that it was always floating in the sky outside of time. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, in any case, its existence outside of time offers an easy solution to the perceived discrepancy between Placidus X being Elden Lord before the Erdtree and Godfrey being first Elden Lord. Placidus X was once Elden Lord, and then once he was removed from time, he is no longer having been Elden Lord. Which is not a very grammatically correct sentence, but talking about time shenanigans. Uh, now, a less complex solution to this is that Godfrey being first Elden Lord is just propaganda, but since we have time shenanigans available to explain things, I don't see why we shouldn't use it. Um, I would also point out that technically only the arena is considered outside of time because it is in the center of the storm. Uh, but Paramazula in general is sort of stuck in time. You know, you can rest as much as you want and time never passes, the sun never moves. And you can also not see Faramazula from anywhere in the lands between besides the isolated divine tower. That's the only place. I know people think that you can see it from places. You cannot. It's only the isolated divine tower. It's not even loaded into the game unless you warp to the isolated divine tower or to Faramazula itself. So it's clearly not, and which also I believe strongly suggests that Faramazula was connected to the lands between at some point, because why would you be able to see it from a particular divine tower, the one which is broken off from the, the rest of the land? Sorry, I'm getting stuffed up because I'm talking too much. Um, okay. If you no-clip from Ferrum to Kaled, then Ferrum would unload as soon as you touch Kaled. Yeah, I mean, look, you can, you can test it out. Go anywhere in the lands between besides the isolated Divine Tower. Put a pin in your map where Ferrum Azula is. You will be able to see the pin. You will be able to see that there's nothing there. So I, it, the people have been claiming that you can see it from other places, but I'm absolutely certain that you cannot. It's only the isolated divine tower. Okay, which which means very clearly that Paramazula is in some kind of parallel reality or parallel time, let's say, um, to the rest of the lands between. Okay, uh, on the ancient dynasty. The Ul slash Uld reliefs of travelers, you know, there, there are these uh, stone statues which de, de, which have reliefs um, of some kind of narrative um, in which there's like boats coming to shore and these people being greeted. It sort of looks like uh, uh, like a, maybe a Sumerian version of of um, of like discovery of the new world. Um, the use of the word Marebito to describe Newman. There's also the item description which says that Newman came from, what is it, a land out, they came from outside the lands between. Um, the affiliation between Newman and the Nox and the Eternal, and the similarities to races in other uh, works of media like the Numenorians, the Tuatha, and the Eldin from the Eternal Champion series. That's Eldin with an I. Uh, or no, sorry, it's Eldren. Isn't that what it is? Why did I write Elden with an I? It's Eldren. I think that's what they're called. Yeah, why did I say Elden? I'm getting Elden rings. Um, the Eldren from the Eternal Champion series. This all strongly su suggests to me that the Newman, a humanoid race, entered the lands between from another world in the sense of another dimension or universe rather than just another continent, something that is metaphysically separate. Now, it's also possible that in Elden Ring style of metaphorical storytelling, another continent could be a metaphysically separate place, um, not just a physically separate place. We do have a sea of fog that surrounds the lands between. Um, so, but 
just as a for anyone who has not read any of the Eternal Champion series, there is a race that you, it's basically set in a multiverse. I'm not spoiling anything major here. Set in a multiverse, and there's a race called the Eldrin, and basically they have figured out how to traverse the multiverse, and so they've populated a bunch of different universes. It's this one race. And they're sort of these, like, they're like sort of Tolkien's elves. They're like beautiful, um, elegant, peaceful, um, sort of in tune with all the right good things and beauty and all this sort of stuff. Um, uh, so anyway, there's, there, to me, there's a strong similarity there. And again, Miyazaki has stated explicitly that, uh, he was in, Elden Ring was partially inspired by the Eternal Champion series. Um, now this, regardless of whether this is true, whether they came from another universe or some other metaphysically separate place, this also at least indicates that humans or humanoids did not arise in the lands between and then disperse out to other places, which is actually, I think, an important point that the lands between is not the beginning of life in the universe as a whole, or even the beginning of humanoid life in the universe as a whole. I think that's important, that this is a place that people come to, and also life has developed here, you know, but this is not like, this is not the Garden of Eden exactly. Like, there's other, this is not metaphysically unique. Um, and even the Earth Tree is not metaphysically unique. It's not, let's say, cosmically um, unique. There's, there's other things outside of this, and there's other lives, uh, you know, life forms and other humans of, of a kind, Newman or human, um, humanoids at least, outside the lands between. So I think that's an important point, sorry, to uh, understand the sort of general cosmology in the picture of the world. The existence of the Ul slash Uld civilization or civilizations in the same broad era, as in before the Erd tree prehistory, um, as the Beastmen, implies that even in the earliest days we have any knowledge of, there were humans roughly synchronous with intelligent beasts. Now, because there is something that I find attractive about the idea of, let's say, one, beasts gain intelligence, two, humans split off into evolution from the beasts, and three, then humans found their own dynasty. Um, I like that idea of, like, it's sort of um, allegorical to the process of evolution. Um, there's not a strong indication of that progression. And all we really have, and again, I would say, you know, before the Erd tree, we have to imagine a very, very large time scale. So it is possible, but all we really get is that we know in this era, there are beastmen and there are also humans, and there are also humans from other places. So it, it at least implies that beastmen are just sort of unrelated to humans. Um, in addition, the beastmen frequently work with iron and gold, and architecturally, Fire Missoula is built in a more Byzantine or Roman style, whereas the Ul slash Uld dynasty doesn't seem to often work with metal and is built in a much earlier architectural style, placing the beastmen developmentally well ahead of the Ul slash Uld. So, even though they're beastmen, and so in some sense, you know, developmentally behind the Ul slash Uld, um, physically, uh, they are in civilization, at least as we currently see it, uh, ahead of the Ul slash Uld. And it's possible also that the Beastmen developed, like, they started before the Uld, and then the Uld dynasty collapsed, and then the Beastmen developed, you know, all the, the complexities of their civilization. And initially they were just more primal. Again, we don't have enough context, so... Um, it's also possible that the ancestral followers are related to the Wolf Flesh Wold, which with their eschewal of metalworking would reinforce that idea, this idea of uh, the Wold being developmentally behind the Beastmen. But, to my mind, the ancestral followers are meant to evoke hunter-gatherers, which would place them either originating before the Wolf Flesh Wold or at least separate from it. Um, and we'll get into the ancestral followers in a minute. Oh, man, there's a lot to go. Um, where are we now? Okay, Section D, Giants and the Crucible. So, 
On the theme of metalworking, the hammer, and this is the hammer that you find in Round Table Hold uh, from Hugh, tells us that the art of smithing is said to have originated among the giants. Assuming that that's true, and also that it holds true for the entire context of civilization seen in the game, that would imply giants existed during or prior to the Beastmen civilization. Given that the first weapons of intelligent beasts were stones, however, they either invented smithing during the beast development or before. So in other words, if beastmen use metal and... Uh, now, it's arguable whether beastmen developed their whole civilization before the Erd Tree or not. I guess that's up in the up in the air. Up in the air, yeah, it really is up in the air. Um, in any case, giants, if giants invented smithing, and they invented smithing, in other words, they invented smithing before anyone else did in all the people and civilizations that we see in the game, then that would mean that they invented smithing before the beastmen developed all their metals. Um, it's also possible that the giants weren't the only ones to invent smithing, or that the beastmen manipulated metal by some magical non-smithing means, or that the giants invented smithing as far as the lands between is concerned, but not for Amazula, or that the description is plain incorrect, because it is flagged as hearsay. But again, I find that hard to, um, hard to believe. One problem with the giants having invented smithing is that Merica has a hammer, which specifically comes from the land of the Newman. It's not just a Newman hammer, it is specifically from the land of the Newman, which we know is outside the lands between. Assuming that the hammer's function is to smith or forge, which makes sense given the context, what it does to the Elden Ring, it's uh, shattering and repairing the Elden Ring, um, so it seems thematically related to smithing, and also we don't have really any other context for what a hammer does, uh, anything important that a hammer does besides smithing. Um, so assuming that that's the hammer's function is something related to smithing, then that either means that the Newman independently invented smithing, or that they learned it from the giants and took it back to their lands, which is unlikely, or that the Newman lands are also where giants invented smithing, in other words, that the giants invented smithing outside the lands between, and then came to the lands between, as well as the Newman did, which also seems unlikely, or that Newman are giants. There is no strong evidence to connect giants and Newman otherwise, besides the fact that Radigan, who is Merica, has red hair, which is perhaps the curse of the giants. I don't see this as very indicative, however, as I believe the most compelling answer for this Curse of Red Hair is rather a connection to the Crucible. A Crucible is a vessel in which molten metal is contained for smithing purposes, so apart from anything else, this intuitively connects to the Fire Giants and their supposed invention of smithing, and of course the Giant's Forge. So, although there's no obvious connection in the text, uh between the Crucible and the Giants, I think it is... A, a, it's not a very large leap to make. They literally have a giant Crucible, and a Crucible is something that used for smithing, and Giants invented smithing, supposedly. Um, Saucy Pup asks... By the way, hi, Saucy Pup. Um, smithing is kind of like the five digits, a sign of evolution slash intelligence. No? Um, it's certainly a sign of, let's say, civilization, which would be indicative of intelligence. However, we know that the beasts gained five fingers, and we also know that their first weapons were stone. So they didn't immediately, uh, start smithing once they gained intelligent, intelligence. I would assume that, like, them using stone is not... That, that has to be after their intelligence, because if you're a beast and you're not intelligence, you just fight with your claws or whatever, or you're, you're, you bite people. So... Um, okay, in addition, there is a theme of life being created from or associated with different kinds of mineral or metal materials. We have albinorix created from silver, claymen, presumably from clay, crystallians, arguably from glintstone, Copper is a conduit for the will. Uh, there's, we can get into the weeds on that one. 
Um, and of course, there's all this gold, which sort of symbolizes all this life. Um, a smithing crucible is also associated with fire, and the Erd tree grew from the crucible. So taking those two ideas together, along with this theme of regression and cycles, it might follow. I say would, but I will, I will say might. I'll couch a little bit. It might follow that the way we burn the Erd tree to forge a new order at the end is in some way a reversion to the crucible. And the way we do that is by activating the giant's forge. We activate the giant's crucible. Um, in the 1.0 version, the misbegotten who made contact with the crucible are called Radigan Chimera. And the developer notes call them Radigan Children, which implicitly connects Radigan with the crucible. Now, of course, okay, cut content, yada, yada, yada. Um, Radigan's agenda to become complete and to repair the Elden Ring also implies a thematic association to the Crucible. Therefore, the simplest way to explain the Curse of Red Hair in both, in both the case of the Fire Giants and Radigan is that they both independently symbolize a connection to the Crucible, rather than assuming that there is any direct connection between the two, which would confuse the issue of Radigan being Merica. Unless, of course, Newman are Giants. This crucible explanation for the Curse of Red Hair might be extended to Radigan's daughter Melania as well. The mass of roots in the Aeonian Swamp as a result of her blooming with rot could be seen as a sort of manifestation of the crucible. And crucible is associated with this, uh, let's say in Siluria's uh, spear and helmet, um, we see that this sort of representation of the crucible as this swirling mass of roots, and that's exactly what we see in the Aeonian Swamp. Um, it's not just rot flowers blooming in the Ionian Swamp. It's literally like giant tree branches. Uh, so the idea that this is related to the Crucible is, I think, very clear. Uh, we also have this cut content of the Flower Crucible. Um, and I think there are other reasons to suspect that essentially the Crucible... Essentially, there's something like we have a, a mass of roots in which a flower blooms, and from that comes the Erd tree, a golden tree. Uh, Justin points out, uh, astrologers were friends with the giants, perhaps the Newmans were astrologers. Yeah, and I completely forgot to add the astrologers into this timeline at all, so just keep that in mind, that there's nothing about the astrologers in here when there really should be, because clearly if we're talking about the Fire Giants, they should be synchronous with the Astrologers, which means uh, prior to the age of the Erd Tree. Um, yeah, so that is also a possibility. But on the smithing front, I don't think that explains the smithing thing, as far as the Newman are concerned, why they would why there would be a hammer uh, from the lines of the Newman uh, if Giants invented smithing for everyone. It could just be explained by Newman also invented smithing outside the lines between. Uh, that's the simplest explanation. Or maybe Newman or Giants. I'm just going to put that idea in everyone's head. Uh, I'm leading up to something. Okay, so... Um, give me a second, I just need to drink some water. I see there's some fighting in the chat. I like it. Uh, I will once again remind everyone to join the Discord. In the Discord, there's a place for the most strict text-based uh, theory crafting, as well as the most frenzied, wild, schizophrenic uh, posting. Um, there is also a Colosseum for people to just duke it out um, uh, on and, you know, insult each other and whatever uh if you want to so it's really a place for everyone all the all the approaches are welcome uh okay moving on to section e the flame of ambition so overall there's not much to say about the fire giants specifically that leads anywhere strongly um they worship a god who inhabits their torso which i believe is sort of 
the metaphor of a god or belief system being in your heart made literal, like people talk about a god-shaped hole um, in a secular society, for example. Um, I think this is literally it. Like the trolls have a god-shaped hole in their in their torso. Uh, they are without a god, and so the fell god is like this inhabits them in the same way that the Elden Ring or the Elden Beast inhabits the body of America slash Radigan. Um. Yes, Justin, I am saying Merica might be giant related because she's a Newman and therefore via the hammer and also via Radigan that might indicate a link between the giants. I'm not saying that's I'm this is a crazy theory, but possible. Uh also Colo RPG, absolutely linking the first flame is the right thing to do. Um Let me say that it's not the right thing to do. It's the least wrong thing to do. That's a better way to put it. Um, okay. Now the concept... Oh yes, that's right. Okay, so the Fell God, which inhabits the Fire Giants, seems to grant them the ability to manipulate fire. Although in the only case we observe, this can only be achieved by some kind of sacrifice. Um, now, the concept of fiery sacrifice extends to a couple other places, such as in the Death Rites, the Gelmir Hexes, and Melina's activation of the Forge. There might be another one that I'm forgetting. Um, but I believe there is a deeper connection between fire and life and death. Um, all throughout the lands between, we see smoldering bodies, some quote-unquote dead and some still quote-unquote alive and crucified. Um, I'm putting quotes because... In the Golden Order, this is a bit confusing. How's it going, John? Oh, and hey, Jarhead. Uh, welcome. Okay, so we have all these smoldering bodies. Now, given the taboo nature of fire in Erdtree-dominated society, the most natural conclusion is that these people host some sort of internal fire rather than having been burnt. If they are crucified, why would the Golden Order... Why would an order which is opposed to fire use fire to burn these people? That doesn't make much sense to me. Um, it makes more sense that they are crucified perhaps because they already have this fire inside of them. They ha they are smoldering and therefore um, expressing this, expressing some kind of internal fire. And I think this also lines up with the idea that they are crucified um, with this sort of rune arc. The rune arc is where the, all the blessings pool. And so in some way, the blessings are trying to they are a way of cooling the fire that exists within them. I think that is the most natural interpretation of what's going on there, that the fire is coming from inside. It's coming from inside. Uh, inside the house. So, um, where was I? Oh yes, in addition, there's a couple other things. We have fire blossoms, which is a type of plant that are fertilized by the sparks from the giant's forge. So it's also this idea of fire sort of being embedded in some kind of life. And Morgoth refers multiple times to our flame of ambition, which again, since we are in a Miyazaki story, um, things that sound like metaphors are not necessarily metaphors. There may be a... Uh, there may be a very literal meaning to all this. So, Puzzleheaded asks, so the fell god lives in everyone? That's an interesting question. Um, I, and I, I take that seriously as a question. I don't, I, maybe you meant it ironically, but I actually take that very seriously. Um, but let me just continue with this for a bit. So, I believe that all of this indicates that the essence of life is quite literally fire. It is literally just fire. Like, life is fire. Or at least the vital aspect of life is fire. And so the crucible, which is, you know, a fiery thing that melts life, uh, metal and life are sort of equated in this analogy, this metaphor. Uh, so the crucible is the vital aspect or source of life, and the crucible is fire. And thus, to the degree that life is more vital, it exemplifies fiery aspects. Now, this metaphor of life as a burning flame is not new to Miyazaki, as it goes back to Dark Souls and even Demon Souls to some extent. And I think it can also be clearly drawn back 
to Berserk. There's the Bonfire of Dreams scene, um, and also Griffith's uh, Sacrifice of Lives for his dream. I'm not spoiling too much here. Um, essentially, the idea is that life has a will or a desire towards some kind of dream or vision, and this is symbolized by a bonfire in which humanity, as in Dark Souls, uh, humanity is sacrificed in the bonfire as fuel to allow that dream to manifest. In other words, that is the flame of ambition. If you want to achieve something, like you have to sacrifice things, and you either have to sacrifice yourself or other people, and it's again that theme of attachment and desire for something uh, sort of consuming you like a flame, right? So this is all the same sort of metaphor. In other words, that the essence of life, the will to live, is a fire. So uh, this also adds context to the death rite cult because they attempt to induce a strong will to live by the threat of death. It is in the face of death that the will to live manifests most strongly and the sacrifice of people in a type of fire in that. When people are confronted by death, they want to live more. To put it in poetic terms, when darkness threatens to engulf us, we burn brighter. So this is the central metaphor uh, that life is... The, the essence of life, the vitality of life, is fire. That we all carry this fire within us. And I think, to puzzle-headed point, uh, your point, that the Fel God, does the Fel God live in everyone? The Fel God has one eye, and eyes are very important in, uh, in Elden Ring. One eye, you know, eyes represent vision, right? Eyes are how you see the world. And there's, again, with the metaphor and the literal coming together... The way that you see the world is both a literal depiction of what you see, and it's also a, a magical expression of your worldview. It's the way that you see the world. It's your perspective, your ideology, your belief system. So if you have one eye, that indicates that you see one thing. You're single-minded. That's, that's my sort of interpretation there. So the fire, the flame of ambition, is the flame which sacrifices everything in order to achieve one vision. Uh, yes, as, just, as Justin points out, fire in Elden Ring burns away rot. In Dark Souls, it burns away hollowing. Uh, I would split hairs there, but sure. And it burns away beasthood. Yes, but there's always, like, the opposite to all these things as well, because fire also makes you a beast. Like, it is the thing that the internal flame, it can consume you, right? So it's it's the thing which gives you life. And if there's no, if there's no fire, then it's essentially stagnant water, right? Now, there's also flowing water, so that's another metaphor. So all the metaphors kind of converge, but... but uh, you know, let's say like the deep in Dark Souls 3, the idea is that this is completely without any fire to it. This is humanity with, with no fire. This is why the dark is something that's sort of viscous and, and heavy and soft. And in the deep, you get these dregs and it's just a, an endless ocean. It's an ocean without fire. It's, it's only... Um, there There is no ambition, essentially. There's no vision to change the world. Um, and therefore, it, it is lacking fire. So, I believe this metaphor provides the most important context to understanding destined death. Destined death. Sorry, I'm getting all uh, clogged up because I'm speaking too much and I haven't had enough water today. Um, this is the most important context to understanding destined death and by extension the golden order. Life burns brightly, not despite death, but because of it. That is extremely important. I think this is one of the most important things to understanding Elden Ring. That life burns because of death. That life is made more vital because of death. Okay, this is why the Erd Tree's leaves are falling and why the lands between are, as Melanus says, in dire need of repair and death indiscriminate. Right? We need to repair the Elden Ring, but it's also that we need death indiscriminate because the lands between are, are stagnant. Um, and again, this is the most common theme in all of Miyazaki's works, that everything is about stagn is, is stagnation. You cling too long to, to one thing, and it, and it stagnates. 
uh, you need things to change. Um, by removing destined death and by extension the flame of ambition which burns in the face of death, life is ostensibly preserved, but the essence or vitality of life is quenched. So we have life under the Golden Order, but because there's no death, there is no flame of ambition. You cannot change anything, everything is stagnant. Now, arguably, this interpretation rubs up against the line in the announcement trailer, which says, that which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance, referring to the Elden Ring. So the Elden Ring currently does not contain destined death. So if it is currently giving life its fullest brilliance, that would sort of contradict my interpretation. Uh, this could be rectified by saying that the Elden Ring in the age prior to the Golden Order, the age characterized by the Crucible, gave life its fullest brilliance, although this feels like a bit of a cop-out. I might, I would say, in my interpretation, that destined death gives life its fullest brilliance. Um, now, I strongly feel like my interpretation makes sense given the current in-game context, so if the announcement trailer, which is not canonical, raises questions, I'm okay with dismissing them to some degree, even if that's a bit evasive. So, a bit of a cop-out, but um, I think you could sort of uh, do some mental acrobatics to make that line work uh, with this interpretation. Um, anyway, that's that's where I am on the flame of ambition. Uh, is chat just going into pure chaos right now? Everyone, is everyone, uh, everyone good? Okay. Um, moving on to section F, the origins of Godfrey and America. Here we get to the fun stuff. Oh. Yes, as Jarhead and John point out, it is past tense, that which commanded the stars. That's interesting. Yeah, I sort of took giving life to be uh, to be present tense, but it's within the context of the past tense of commanded the stars. So maybe that's true. Okay, well that that uh, that makes me feel a bit better about being evasive there, but um, I don't know. Okay, the origins of Godfrey and America. Now, there are enormous giant skeletons in the mountaintops and in Kaelid, the beings which I refer to as titans. That's not a word in the game, I just like calling them that. And by the way, there are two sizes of titans. I believe the ones in Kaelid, or at least some of them, are actually bigger. Um, so, but these are way bigger than any other giants that we see. They're way bigger than the fire giants, they're way bigger than the giants in the Eternal cities. Okay, evidently they existed in the ancient past, and this is a clear allusion to the Norse creation myth in which the giant Ymir was killed and his corpse became the land of the world. The Ymir was this frost giant who was an enormous, enormous giant who was killed, and then that's the world, is his body. Uh, now, trolls are described as giants. I believe they're called lesser giants and they're also said to be descended from giants um, and clearly you know they have the the hollow chest which is sort of indicative of not being imbued with the fell god which connects them to the fire giants now even among the fire giant corpses in the mountaintops there are two sizes i only discovered this recently through zlovsky's work and if no one knows who zlovsky is you have to go on on the uh, the app or site formerly known as twitter um and find Zlovsky, you can look up Z-L-O-F-S-K-Y-2-N-D, Zlovsky second on X. And um, they take these incredible 4K pictures of various models, uh, creatures and characters and so on in Elden Ring. There's a lot of great lore to be found in those pictures. So... Um, but there there are multiple sizes for the fire giant corpses. There's actually um, one size which is roughly the same as the fire giant that we fight, and there's another size which is much bigger. Now, the, I'm, I'm talking about the impaled corpses. This is not the giant titan 
skulls and, and, and uh, chests. Um, those are way, way, way bigger. But even among the fire giants, there's multiple sizes, is what I'm saying. Um, the northerner starting race is said to be descended from giants. Again, hearsay, but I believe true. Now, it follows that the word giant encompasses various sizes and shapes over the course of history, and that the trend is for them to gradually diminish in size over the generations. If we have huge giant skulls, giant titans, and then we have fire giants, and we have multiple sizes of fire giants, and then we have trolls, which are smaller still, and then we have northerners who are human-sized. So there's this, and this, by the way, this also kind of, there's a general theme of like things being bigger in the past. You have like Grand Sax, for example, versus uh, Grand Sax and Grail um, versus uh, the modern dragons and the rest of the ancient dragons. Um, so this would imply that the Titans are simply the ancestors of the fire giants. Now, we also have giants in the Eternal Cities and the giant skeletons summoned by Tibia Mariners. Drawing from Norse myth, there are, so in Norse myth, you have both the fire giants and the frost giants. Um... It's possible that you have the same thing in Elden Ring, that you had two ancestries of giants, and that the ones in the Eternal Cities are totally unrelated to the ones in the mountaintops. But there's not any really solid evidence for that idea, and you already have this theme of fire versus ice um, played out uh, as far as the fire giants versus the Zamor are concerned, or the fire giants versus the ice dragons. So... Um, the idea, which I believe is fact, that at least some humans are descended from giants opens some doors for interesting connections in the lore. Um, I've mentioned this before, but let's look at Horalu or Godfrey. So Horalu is an enormous figure. He's way bigger than a normal human. And he roars, which is perhaps like a beast, like a lion, but also perhaps like a troll or giant. The roar medallion specifically refers to giants. Uh, Horfrost Stomp shares his name, and Hora has a signature stomp. He does a big stomp, so if you've got a Hor Stomp, um, one of them is the Horfrost Stomp, and one of them is Hora's Stomp. Um, now, here's a chain of connections, which is, I think, interesting. Hora Lu is Chieftain of the Badlands, right? The Great Axe is the weapon of choice of Badlands Chieftains. And the Highland Axe is clearly of the same design as the Great Axe. This implies that the Highlands and the Badlands are one at the same, or at least intimately connected. Now, the Japanese doesn't use the word Badlands at all, which in English connotes a dry, usually hot terrain, like you'd find in like Arizona or New Mexico or something like this. Um, but it rather just calls them the Barbarian Lands. So it doesn't say Badlands in regards to the Great Axe or to Horalu. Uh, the Highlands are where Rhymed Roa grows. This is in the description for Rhymed Roa. So we know where the Highlands are. That's the mountaintops of the giants. So this all pretty directly suggests that Horalu came from the mountaintops. So, and I, I actually, I don't even think it suggests it. I think it, that just means that that's true. I think it's clear that the, the battle, well, okay. You have to make the, the leap that the Badlands and the Highlands are the same place. But I don't think that's, hard to believe at all. I think that's that's completely... Um, that just makes sense. So... Horalu came from the mountaintops. And that would also explain the Horfrost stomp thing. So, now this is a bit weird because the hero starting class, which is intimately connected to the Badlands and to Horalu, is a bit skimpy on gear for a cold environment. Right? doesn't seem like they'd be at home in a snowy place. However, there may be an explanation. Although there is no need to explain why a mountaintop is cold, the current state of things is such that the giant's flame is no longer active and all the fire giants are dead save one. It is theoretically possible that in the past when the flame was active, the mountaintops were much warmer, even potentially volcanic. I think that may be important, actually. The Consecrated Snowfield has a frozen river. And rivers are pretty important as far as the Ensel and Sheeper are concerned, but we don't really have a river above ground uh, besides this frozen one. Now, the distinction between flowing water and still water has been an important metaphor in Miyazaki's previous stories, especially most recently in Sekiro. Sekiro, that was the entire cosmology, essentially, of Sekiro um, was about flowing water, right? 
and sort of how the water sort of pools at the bottom and becomes stagnant. And it's been all over the place. This is why Miyazaki loves poison swamps. The concept of Kigare, and you can just talk to Ezer Aesthetics about that. Uh, Kigare meaning like this sort of corruption and that happens from stagnation. Uh, in Dark Souls, you know, time is time is not convoluted. Time is stagnant. Um, and again, the deep and all this stuff. This has been a, a theme throughout of, of the distinction between still and flowing water. And we also have that with Melania. Like Melania, the rot, the way that she combats the rot is by learning from a swordsman who has this sort of affiliation with flowing waters. Because if you flow, then you sort of, it's like being in the Tao. You're, you're able to uh, be at peace with the inequities of life and move forward rather than sort of sitting in it and rotting. Something like that. Okay, so the idea that there's a frozen river may be actually very important. The current age is an order which begets stagnation, and the current order is defined by not having fire in it. So it's possible that the frozen river is part of a metaphor symbolizing that stagnation. In the age of the fiery crucible in the giant's flame, perhaps the river flowed, symbolizing the continuity and progression of life as opposed to its current stasis. Um, Patrick brings up a good point. Was Godfrey sent to the Badlands? I believe he was just sent outside the lands between. Um, I need to, I need to look at the text there. I need to look at the text. Uh, I, I, uh, huh. that's an annoying little, uh, quibble that I'm not sure about. I feel like the idea that Godfrey is descended from giants just makes a lot of sense, but I need to think about that. Um, moving on, Kaiden swords, who are described as hulking, hail from the north, although they appear to be more at home in a cold environment compared to, the, let's say, the hero starting class. Um... There's also, I would just point out uh, on the theme of, uh, on the idea of Godfrey, that he has perfectly white hair, and he's got fairly light skin, whereas like Nefeli Lu, I believe she has black hair, and she's got darker skin, so that the hero gear makes, that sort of implies that that's a hot place with a hot sun, um, which wouldn't be the mountaintops currently. So... But Godfrey maybe isn't from there. I don't know. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll have to think about Godfrey some more. Um, hmm. Arch Crusader says, Always felt like the Badlands were like a colony influenced by Horaloo's homeland in the Highlands that Godfrey established after being sent outside the lands between, somewhere like a desert. That's an interesting idea. That in other words, Horalu came from the Highlands. Then when he was, then he became Godfrey. Then Godfrey was expelled, and then he went to the Badlands and became a Badlands chieftain. That's an interesting idea. I'll have to think about that one. I think there's, yeah, there's more stuff I have to think about on this question. Okay, uh, so Kaiden sell swords. Uh, they live in the. They come from the north. Now we don't know where Kaiden is, so it's either destroyed or renamed. But it's interesting that they have an affinity for both horses and wolves. I would also point out that it's interesting that they clearly have a sort of Anglo-Celtic um, style to them, like their helmet and so on, um, and that could potentially connect to um, Godfrey's. Uh, sort of culture and the names of like Ordovis and Siluria. Um, so that's another interesting connection, although I don't know where that leads. Now, as they have an affinity for both horses and wolves, 
Judging by his hooves, Torrent is ostensibly a horse. He has horse hooves. Right? He doesn't have goat hooves. Um, he prefers rhymed Roa to other versions of Roa, which suggests a cold place of origin. Now, given the DLC image of what appears to be Mikola riding Torrent, I would say it appears to be Mikola. I'm not convinced that it is Mikola. Um, I think it's possible that it is Merica, um, because I think that Mikola is... <laughs> Let's just say that Mikola is Merica, um, but exactly what that means is up for debate. Uh, in my in my view, it's possible that Torrent was originally a horse in the consecrated snowfield, where not only Mikola has influence but also ancestral followers exist. Which, given Torrent's ancestral spirit adjacent qualities, might also support the idea. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, in fact, the DLC image of a field of golden wheat depicts a past memory of the consecrated snowfield before the giant's flame was quenched. Um, the fact that I wouldn't be surprised by it doesn't mean that I believe it's true. I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised by it. Uh... It, okay, let me just put a little bit more context um, to what I, <laughs> what I said. I believe that Mikla is Merica in the sense that Radigan is Merica and Mikla is, yes, Melania is Radigan. Melania and Mikla are both Merica and Radigan. I mean, just in, in the simplest sense of it, it in that Merica and Radigan are the same person. And therefore, their children don't have any other genes. They are born from a single person, which means that they are, you know, clones, let's say. They are, there's no new genetic material. They're not the creation of two, uh, two life forms um, having sex, right? They're the creation of a single life form, essentially, you know, blooming or sprouting or, or whatever. However, Mikla and Melania were born. Uh, they are just, a, they are a kind of copy or splinter or something like that, right? But they are not the, um, they are not, they are not like, let's say, Godwin is perhaps, um, or, or Morgoth, you know, or other children that we know of. Um, I mean, of course, there's all sorts of questions about exactly how people are born in Elden Ring. And I did a whole video on that, essentially, but... Whatever Mikkel and Melania are, there's something special about them being born from one god, from the single person god. And therefore, you know, if there is a, an analogy to genes, or if genes exist or whatever in Elden Ring, um, they are a copy of that. So they're twins who are born from one person, um, you know, uh, parthenogenetically. So there is no new material there. Th that's what I mean by Mikkel is America. Now, whether that has like more metaphysical connotations to it um, is, is up in the air. So that's what I mean. I believe Mikola is Merica, but what exactly that means is a, is a bit uh, more confusing. Okay, the Newmen are described as being long-lived but seldom born. The warriors of Zamor are also described as long-lived and given Merica's eventual war with the giants in which Zamor knights fought for the Erdtree faction, it's possible that the Newman and Zamor are intimately connected or even related. Um, Long-lived is also used to describe the beasts in the ancestral follower culture whose horns bud over and over. Now, there may be a connection here between Merica's Erdtree and the budding of horns, which has a plant-like connotation. And that plant-like connotation can be further developed by pointing out that the beasts in the ancestral follower culture are all herbivorous beasts, right? They're like uh, deer and things like that, right? They're not, um, they're not bears. There are no bears in, in the ancestral follower culture. Um, so, and this distinction between herbivorous and carnivorous beasts in main, is maintained in some of the crafting item descriptions as well. For example, I think. Beast blood specifically mentions carnivorous beasts, whereas the budding horn specifically mentions herbivorous beasts. I might be misremembering that, but if it's not those descriptions, it's a, it's other ones. 
So, but it does specify herbivorous and carnivorous, which is interesting. Um, now the, oh yes, perhaps the violent consuming, absorbing life of the crucible in its fiery, active defiance of death is contrasted by the long-lived plant-like growth of trees and herbivorous beasts. So in other words, there may be something about like a sort of peaceful cycle of life, which, uh, goes for longevity, something which is more plant-like in nature, uh, versus something which is more violent, which is in which life is shorter. Um, but there's a more sort of continuous cycle of life. And I would also say that I think the Draconian sort of starting race says that they're short lived. So and that would kind of go along with this, like crucible being associated with violence and the cycle of life and death versus, uh, let's say Newman, who may be associated more with this sort of plant like, uh, long life, um, without as much emphasis on the, the death and production of new life. The, the, basically the theme being that new life comes with death. They are part of the same idea. Death means new life. New life means death. If you have a longer life, that means you have le less death, which means that you have less new life. That's why the new and, um, are seldom born. So there's a, there's a overall, I think a kind of theme connecting all of this. Um, now, given, uh, oh, where are we? Okay. Right. This is a bit of a non sequitur, but it makes sense. Um, hi, well, he found. Naughton says, elaborate on Merica being Hugh's son. I said, I will not elaborate. I will not elaborate. Merica is Hugh's son. I'm not going to say anything more about it. If we accept the clear allusion to Arthurian legend, the weapons embedded in the round table were the weapons of Godfrey and his knights. These weapons appear to be grown rather than forged. The thorn swords impaling the fire giants also have this half plant, half weapon style. Although there is a bit of speculation involved here, I believe that Merica was in possession of some sort of tree power related to the ancestral follower culture, rather derived from that or just similar in concept. Given that the giant grace in the round table appears to be emerging from the weapons, and the fact that the round table appears to be a memory of the real round table, and the way that remembrances of powerful beings are hewn into the Erd tree, I believe there is a very important metaphor regarding the preservation of memories in trees. Now, again, as we've been we've been discussing in the Discord, um, the question of the distinction between souls and spirits and spirit bodies and memories and wraiths and phantoms and all this stuff. Because there's a lot of inconsistencies both in the English and in the Japanese and inconsistent amongst themselves as well. So um, my sort of overall leaning is towards... Um, a tripartite model of existence in which you have a physical body, a sort of spirit, which is, let's say, something like your, your memories, your mind, your emotions, and then a soul, which is something a bit more abstract, and it's a part of the sort of divine whole of existence. Um, that's just the interpretation that makes the most sense to me. Um, and I believe spirits are closely tied with memory. Um, now, what this would sort of imply is that, that you can grow plants by, uh, you can grow plants by coalescing memories, which are spirits into the plant life. And I think there's, there's also, there's an idea there of like the spirits of things being tied to the earth. And that's why a plant, you know, a tree draws from the earth and therefore it is fed by the spirits, which are the memories that are sort of encapsulated in the land. You think of like what a ghost is in, in the sort of Western culture, a ghost is that you know, it's like the imprint of some strong emotion 
that that's that's what people believe right a ghost is like you have a haunted house or you have a burial ground or something like this it's like some strong emotion sort of curses this place and it's cursed to the land like you can destroy the building and then build a new building on top of it the ghost is still there now there's other sort of parallels to that in in japanese myths and you know superstitions and whatnot so this this is a broadly universal idea that like um things can be tied to the land and i believe there's something like that in Elden Ring. This ties in with like the Mausoleum Knights and the Death Bird stuff and Death Rites. Um, and also like, okay, good example, the Fallen Hawks who burn their fellows in Ghost Flame. They burn the bones of their fellows in Ghost Flame and this prevents them from essentially returning to the above ground because they're tied, they're now tied to the underground from that act. Um, something like that. So I think if you tie spirits and memories to the land and then a tree grows the tree draws from the land so it's fed by those spirits and memories so i think this is basically what merica is all about what the earth tree is about what her earth tree is about and i think it's related if not derived from this ancestral spirit culture or perhaps the causality is reversed there it could be that the newman sort of introduced this practice to ancestral spirits or it could just be that they're like related ideas okay but basically the the metaphor the important takeaway is memories being preserved in trees i think that's the important thing okay section g oh my god we're almost there and i really need to go like i'm gonna have to just dip right after we're done here so sorry about that but i just wanted to get this out of the way and then uh, we can see what happens tonight. Okay, death rites and snakes. The death rite cult is clearly pre Erd tree because death was burning ghost flame when in the time when there was no Erd tree. Now, in, as I've argued in my previous video, I believe the death rite cult is the direct antecedent to the Erd tree religion, based partly on the bald monk statues, uh, the similarity between those statues to the priests that are embedded in the death bird's wings and the similarity in the worship of a tree which produces a guiding light. Um, in fact, the death rites could have been completely integrated into Erd tree worship right up until the creation of the Golden Order. Now, I believe Destined Death was part of the Elden Ring during the death rite cults before the Erd tree, uh, which would imply that when the order changed and Destined Death was removed, the death rites would have gone out of fashion, to put it mildly. Uh, because if their death rite revolves around something which operates on the principle of destined death, then once you change destined death, once you remove that from the order, then anything which is about destined death is probably anathema, or at least it's um, it's not cool anymore. Um, is the audio fine? Okay, sorry. I'm also, I'm getting more animated, so I'm like, I'm moving side to side in the mic sometimes, so sorry about that. Okay, uh, where was I? Death Rites, blah, blah, blah. Okay, oh yeah, I have no idea where the twin bird fits into this, but it being a creature of duality suggests that it's aligned with the order side of the greater sort of order slash chaos duality, because if you have two things that form you know, a, a dichotomy that is a kind of order. So that, that's pretty vague though. Um, however, I think you can kind of draw a connection e that each of the outer gods or divine forces seem to fit relatively clearly on one side or the other of that duality. Rot is clearly a kind of order. Again, you have a progression you have a cycle of life and death you have things that are opposites and they are sort of structured um, and also it is literally described as an order of rot uh, the frenzied flame is definitely chaos and the formless mother seems much more chaos oriented or at least regression oriented rather than being aligned with order and causality now i suspect that the formless mother is related in some way to the crucible or even just the crucible itself partly because you have this blood and flame thing you have this affiliation with omens um which is clearly you know the, those are crucible aspects that they manifest 
And a mother is just a great metaphor to describe the source of life, this vital thing of life, um, blood and fire. And also this is associated with the color red and, and all of this stuff. So to me, it's the formless mother is either something that is extremely closely connected to the crucible or she's just the crucible uh, itself. Now, there's a strange parallel that can be drawn between the death rite cult and the worship of the immortal serpent deity. Both seem to be connected with hexes, in which the skulls of dead souls appear amongst flame, and both seem to involve some kind of sacrifice. In fact, the sacrificial axe has a very direct analog in the serpent god's curved sword, one restoring FP and the other HP, respectively. In addition, both Rikard sorceries, developed from Gelmir hexes, and ghost flame sorceries, associated with the death rites, require a mixture of faith and intelligence to cast, which is curiously only mirrored again in the Golden Order incantations, as well as the other two death sorceries, Fia's Mist and the Tibia Summons. There is also a more tenuous but equally interesting connection. The Gelmir staff, which enhances Rikard sorceries, uses red glinstone. Red glinstone is formed from the blood of sacrifices, according to Albrecht's set, and the formation of glinstone from the blood of sacrifices is performed by the Staff of the Guilty, which is a smoldering sapling. The Death Rite cult revolves around a tree, which is called Lampwood. To me, this implies that part of it is on fire, and within the faith of the Ur tree, religion is a sinister prophecy in which the Ur tree is set on fire, which we fulfill by activating the power of Giant's Flame within a crucible and unleashing destined death. Let's take it one step further. Selen calls Glinstone the Amber of the Cosmos, but she also draws a distinction between Golden Amber, which houses the vitality of ancient life, and Glinstone, which houses the vitality of the stars. It's unclear where red glinstone formed from the blood of sacrifices fits into this picture but it's worth pointing out that all things golden seem to have had a reddish tint in the ancient past associated with the crucible if glinstone is amber then red glinstone is kind of red amber and if golden amber was once reddish in the past it begs the question whether they're one and the same thing if so this would imply that melina sacrificing herself to the flames burning the earth tree should produce a giant red rock that we can use to cast lava sorceries that's a joke by the way in all seriousness, no, uh, though, this could imply that the modern-day Erdtree religion incorporated elements from both the Serpent religion and the Deathbird religion, although to precisely what end isn't clear. Now, one thing I would point out on that point is that there is imagery of the Caduceus, which in several cases is very clearly two snakes wrapped around each other. Um... And the interesting cases here are the, for example, the depraved perfumer set. Now, the perfumers, uh, the, the normal perfumer set is very clearly has a relationship, as Cosmos pointed out in this video, to the Knox monks. And um, the, the, uh, I just completely lost my train of thought there. Depraved Perfumer set, Caduceus, um, two snakes. So yes, the fact that the perfumers would be associated with the Nox and also the Erd Tree and then also two snakes is very weird. Also, D's armor set uh, has two snakes on it. What exactly that means, and then we have Caduceus stuff related to Mikla and related to the Crucible in general and all sorts of things, and the Sacred Relic Sword, the Finger Slayer Blade, um, even perhaps like the Oracle Envoy Horns, and all sorts of things have this, have this Caduceus pattern. We only know of one snake in the game, um, but it is implied that something about two snakes and maybe... We have two snakes, and then we have this sort of parallel with a twin bird that kind of makes sense that there's a twin snake, you know? Um, but one of them is dead, or one of them... I don't know. Well, I think this possibly may be important because, of course, in the DLC image, we have two trees. We have a, what looks like a shadowy Erd tree, as well as something wrapped around it in a caduceus pattern, essentially. 
So, and we also have ulcerated tree spirits, which are literally called uh, snake soul in the um, game files. And they're, you know, snake-like creatures, which are born from, what, minor Erd trees, I suppose, from the Erd tree itself. So there's a connection between snakes and trees, and obviously there's the Garden of Eden story and all sorts of things. So not exactly sure what's going on there, but it seems to me like this immortal snake worship and this twin bird religion uh, are both antecedents. They're both elements of them were incorporated into the Erd Tree religion. Um... Now, the Staff of the Guilty, which is the sort of key item to understanding all this, it scales with faith alone, and it enhances thorn sorceries. And then we have thorny swords. There's clearly some kind of thorny magic, which was used to impale the fire giants. And I've connected this with Merica before, that Merica has some kind of plant power. And also the thorn swords have an upturned semicircle on them, which could be an expression of Merica's rune, this upturned semicircle. Now, one way to look at this could be that Merica and the Glomide Queen were perhaps twins. Uh, an expression of sort of opposites and dualities in the way that Mikola and Melania are, um, with Merica, well, let's say the Glomide Queen sort of expressing the rune of death, and Merica expressing the rune of light, perhaps. And there are past, uh, like, cut content things that refer to a Rune of Life curse. So, um, some kind of twin thing could make sense, which could also be compatible with my idea that the that Merica is the Glomide Queen, because Mikla and Melania are Merica and Radigan, as I've just <laughs> explained. So, Let's say that all Empyreans are born of the same god. I know that's debatable, but let's say that they are born of a single god. Um, then that means that Merica and the Glomide Queen were born of a single god, which means that they are they are the single god, which means that they are the same person. QED. Okay, moving on. Uh, section H, Birth of the Erd Tree, the Golden Order, and the War with the Giants. This is where I started to fall apart, so now things are going to get a little bit um, more sparse. But I'll just, I just want to get through this really quick. So, in ancient times, giants were mortal enemies of the Erd Tree, which definitively means that the Erd Tree already existed prior to the end of the War with the Giants. However, what is not definitive is exactly what the Erd Tree is or was at that time. The Crucible was the Erd Tree in its primordial form. And there's all this controversy about the Great Tree as well. There's also golden illusory trees and a depiction of a solid wood-colored Erd Tree on the Icon Shield. So I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but I think there's enough ambiguity about what the Erd Tree is and was and maybe how it developed over time that I don't feel particularly confident about any timeline. Um, and I'm suspicious of anyone who says that they know for sure. Um... Keep in mind that we know of not only minor Erd trees, but also an attempt at growing a full-fledged new Erd tree in Elf Bale, which, by the way, also is basically two trees twisting around each other. And in the final boss arena, we see 30-odd golden trunks, which strongly implies that the Erd tree is not by any means cosmically unique. Here's a crazy idea. In fact, drawing from the Eternal Champion series, I could see a perfectly plausible cosmology in which the Newman race figured out how to travel between different worlds, spreading their golden seed magic, their golden tree magic, both figuratively and literally, and growing giant Erd trees by some sort of sacrificial blood magic which allows them to play God. I think that's a plausible uh, context for the story. In any case, my intuition is that the Erd Tree, which existed during and perhaps prior to the War with the Giants, was a normal-looking tree which was on fire. Once the Giant's Flame was sealed, the fire stopped and the tree grew and flourished with abundance. Taking my earlier metaphor of memories being stored in trees, in the specific case of the Golden Godfrey Shade, which seems to be a spectral memory of Godfrey, I suspect that the Golden Spectral Carapace, which covers the Erd Tree currently, is a more recent invention 
after the Earth tree began to die, created by the same kind of memory inscribing mechanism. In other words, what we have, my sense of things, and I'm not going to say this is strongly supported, I just think this is what makes the most sense to me, is that perhaps even the reason with the War with the Giants, but at least during a time in which there was both America and Giants sort of alongside each other, not I, alongside as in synchronous in time, not necessarily on the same side. Um, I believe that the Erd Tree existed, but it was in a state of constant, let's say, smoldering. Um, and then once the Giant's Flame was sealed, the Erd Tree grew and it flourished with abundance. And then uh, it started to die. And that's basically because of this idea that in order to have new life, you must have death. And you cannot have... You cannot just extend life without consequence. All right? Everything is in binaries, so if you just hold to one side of a binary, the other side is going to slap you in the face. So you get rid of fire. Okay, well, the tree grows and it flourishes, but only for a short while. And then it's just going to start dying, and now you have a problem. Okay, so then what's your what's the problem? How do you solve that? Well, now we're going to remove destined death, because then it's going to stop the tree from dying. And somehow that creates this golden carapace around the earth tree. That's the creation of the golden order. And I believe that that is the, as I point out in the next sentence, when was the golden order founded? Presumably the golden order is synchronous with the creation of this golden carapace on the earth tree which means it was founded as the Ur tree began to die, which makes sense because removing destined death would mean the Ur tree would be prevented from dying. And I would point out that destined death, although it has an affiliation with the flames, I think that it's more the expression of the principle of death, and therefore you, the reason that you have to get rid of destined death as well as the giant's flame is that the giant's flame is what burns the Ur tree, but when you first activate the giant's flame, there's still no destined death. So it's, it can burn the Erd tree, but the Erd tree can't die. So you need destined death to be unleashed in order for that flame to actually work. It's like it's like the flame is there, but the, the code says it doesn't do anything. The code of the universe. Okay. Um, it's not clear whether Merica was the one to remove destined death. Ostensibly... It is Merica's Golden Order. I don't think it's ever said that, that way, Merica's Golden Order, but it seems like it's associated with her. However, she also seems to be opposed to the Golden Order currently. At the end of the game, we can add runes to the Elden Ring in order to change it. We don't know exactly what the rules are for removing runes, but the only context we have for changing the Elden Ring at all is that the Elden Lord is the one who changes the ring, which might suggest that Merica was not the one to remove destined death. The obvious second candidate would be Radigan, who is Merica, but also not Merica. So if it's true that only the Elden Lord changes the Elden Ring, then that means that Merica did not create the Golden Order. And that would make sense that she is now opposed to it because she may not have been on board with it from the very beginning. Okay, final section. I know we're still, this is still only like half the story, but this is all I can do. It's already been like two hours. Okay, um, Roundtable Hold in Merica's plan. According to Gideon, Roundtable Hold was created to put a tarnish on, upon the throne of Elden Lord. And I believe actually one of the info things says that the Roundtable Hold to exists, the Roundtable Hold exists to guide the tarnish, which and put them on the proper path, which I guess is to become Elden Lord. Now, Hugh is a prisoner here, implied to have been imprisoned by Merica herself, which arguably means that Merica created the Round Table Hold, and that she intended for a Tarnish to become Elden Lord. Which lines up with the prediction or plan she outlines in her echoes. Merica, uh, right, because Merica says that she's going to, I'm going to divest thee of, of thy grace, and then you're going to go outside the lands between, you're going to die and grow stronger in the face of death, and then grace will be restored to you, 
come back, face the Elden Ring, and become Elden Lord. That's the idea. This is like her plan. This is what she wants to do. So it makes sense that she creates the Round Table Hold as a function of that plan. Um, but one thing I'd point out here is that the two fingers exist in Round Table Hold. Now, the only living, if you can call it living two fingers, in the lands between that we know of is Ronnie's two fingers. Um, because the ones that exist in our Round Table Hold are, the Round Table Hold does not exist in this world. It is very explicitly outside of this world. My sort of suspicion, um, now in an interview, Miyazaki said that the, the reason for the Round Table Hold's existence has something to do with the two fingers. And you could interpret that by saying the two fingers created Round Table Hold, but I think it's my sort of intuition is that America created the Round Table Hold and put the two fingers in there in order to subvert their connection to the greater will so that she could sort of control things. That's my suspicion. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I suspect, suspect is true. Okay, so America wants to slay a god. This is very explicit. Hugh, wants, you know, Hugh is instructed to craft a weapon to slay a god, and that is for us. So America wants a Tarnished to become Elden Lord, and in order to do that, they have to slay a god. Now, the Golden Order is founded on the principle that America is the one true God. Therefore, that means that America wants us to slay America. Now, of course, America in her echoes tells Radigan that he is not her yet, and that he is not yet a God, which implies that later he became America and became God. So, that could mean that Crunchy, uh, Crunchy, uh, what am I saying? Crunchy, I was reading a comment now, and now I'm getting distracted. My mind's going... Um, welcome Firewalk with me, <laughs> and thank you for your comment, although it distracted me. Um, I'm trying to keep in mind the America's plan here. So, America wants us to slay a god, the god that we know is America, but we also know that Radigan is America and is a god, or that's strongly implied at least. So, America could want us to slay Radigan and not America, even though Radigan is America. The Sacred Relic Sword which is formed from the body of Radigan, says that it is wrought from a god who should have lived a life eternal. So, it is created from Radigan's body. Right? It's, it's very clear that the Radigan, you kill Radigan, so America is crucified, America turns into Radigan. Radigan dies, the Elden Beast emerges and takes Radigan's body and turns it into the Sacred Relic Sword. Then you defeat the Elden Beast, and America's body is still there, which is all very weird. But, you know, however you want to explain the America Radigan thing, that, that is the situation, right? So the Sacred Relic Sword is ostensibly referring to Radigan. Whether it's referring to America as well is debatable. Um, but it is clearly referring to Radigan. So the implication is that America wants us to slay Radigan, who is America. And that is what we do. We slay Radigan. So we actually do go with their plan. We need to slay a god in order to become Elden Lord, and that is exactly what we do. We kill God, we kill Radigan, who is America and a god, and then we become Elden Lord. Unless we do one of the other endings. Okay, Melina says that for us to seek the Elden Ring violates the Golden Order. Therefore, America wants to violate the Golden Order, because presumably Melina is referring to the fact that it, uh, we are tarnished, and it's the fact that we are tarnished seeking the Elden Ring that violates the Golden Order. Therefore, America's goal of having a tarnished uh, take the throne of Elden Lord violates the Golden Order. Now, the Golden Order was created by confining destined death. Therefore, America's decision to violate the Golden Order is ostensibly to unconfine destined death, which is what we end up doing. So, why would she need a tarnish to perform this task? This is where it gets a little bit more speculative. Merica took away the tarnished grace and sent them to die outside the lands between. Right? She divested Godfrey and his people of grace, sent them outside the lands between to die, to grow strong in the face of death, and to come back. This seems like an important piece of the puzzle. This implies that dying within the lands between under the Golden Order 
would prevent someone from violating the Golden Order. Because why would you need someone who died outside the Lands Between to violate the Golden Order? Why not someone who's inside the Lands Between? What What is it about Tarnish that makes them especially suitable for this task? Now, I think... Um, since the Golden Order fettered the fate of the night sky, I think a reasonable explanation is that the Golden Order determines one's fate through the process of death, which under the Golden Order works differently than destined death, right? Is, there's still death, but it's not destined death. There's some different kind of death, which is, I believe, souls returning to the Erd Tree. So you die, but you are also reborn. Uh... The Tarnished, having died outside the Lands Between, is somehow exempt from this control of their fate. In some way, I believe this relates to the flame of ambition, which the Tarnished still carries within them, having not been quenched by the Golden Order. This is why Melina appears to take something from you in order to activate the Giant's Fort. She touches your hand, and then you immediately zonk out, right? It's as if she's, like, taking your consciousness away or something, like... She she needs your help. She needs something from you in order to activate the Giant's Forge. I think that's the most reasonable interpretation of that cutscene. And I believe that what she's taking from you is the Flame of Ambition, which you carry within you and nobody else under the Golden Order, people who have died and been reborn under the Golden Order, because that has been uh, uh, quenched. Um, your death outside the Lands Between still operated in the same way that pre-Golden Order death did, in which the threat of death caused one's internal fire of life to burn more brightly. That is why America says you need to grow strong in the face of death. I think this is all very key. This is the... It's the flame of ambition, and this is why Morgart com uh, comments upon it, the flame of ambition is the key part of why the Tarnished needs to become Elden Lord. And that is America's plan. Now, why does she want all that? That's a good question. <laughs> so, that's all I could write uh, in a day. And um, I feel like that's a reasonable half story. Um, but I feel fairly confident about most of these things. Now, I did write just some quick notes here. America was chosen by the Five Fingers. I think this is um, actually very clear because, let's say, those Thorn Swords in the Giants, um, they have little Five Fingers coming out of them. Explosive Ghost Flame, which happened before the Erd Tree, has Five Fingers. Uh, the There's all sorts of Five Fingers stuff that is correlated to before the sort of Erd Tree. So if America was chosen as Empyrean... Um, in that earlier time. I think it just makes sense that she would be chosen by the Five Fingers. Um, it could be that the Five Fingers chose both Merica and the Glomide Queen as Empyreans of that time, um, and sort of Merica won out. I would also point out that the Glomide Queen could have a connection to both snakes and giants. There's no obvious connection between snakes and giants. However, the Glomide Queen is associated with fire, obviously, so that might connect her to the giants. And um, the... The uh, fire giant has these little medallions which look extremely similar to the depiction of the Black Flame sigil. And the Black Flame used to be powered by Dust and Death, and the Giant's Flame is powered by Dust and Death. So, I mean, when we unleash Dust and Death. So, this is all very. And then there's a connection between serpents and fire. And the Glomade Queen's Godskin Apostles have serpent tails. Um, I think the depiction on Elmer's armor of the Glomide Queen uh, is of the Glomide Queen, and, and it has serpents coming out of her hair like a Medusa. So it's possible that, and then it would also just make sense if Merica was opposed to the Glomide Queen, that the Glomide Queen might be allied with the Fire Giants, or even a Fire Giant herself, or some kind of giant. Um, so that's a possibility. I don't really know what to make of it, but uh astrologers yeah, i just didn't really mention the astrologers at all and i don't know how much there is to say about that except that i wonder if you know there's the thing about the 
they lived on mountaintops that reached the sky and they considered the fire giants to be their neighbors. I sort of have this idea in my head, and I feel this is totally just headcanon, but that the astrologers lived on Mount Gelmir. And at that time in the past, Mount Gelmir was the snowy mountain and the mountaintops were the fiery mountain. I don't know why, I just it just feels right. Uh, and so that just... Uh, and it, part, of, part really the only reason that that makes sort of sense to me is that there is this implica this this thing about uh, the Carrions always being on the west coast of Liurnia. Um, and then Rikard goes up to Mount Gelmir and he's the son of Renala. Uh, so I don't know something about that. And, and the Carrions obviously have a relationship to the astrologers. Renala might even be an astrologer or at least descended from them. So that's all possibilities. The amber egg is very confusing, but I believe that the rune of the unborn, at least, is Mikola's rune. I think that's just... I don't... The idea that it's Ronnie's rune doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think it's clearly Mikola's rune. It, if Ronnie had a rune, it should be on the right side of the Elden Ring, not the left side. Um, whereas the Arun of the Unborn is clearly a parallel to Melania's, and it also looks, you know, gold, it looks like un unalloyed gold with a needle in it. I mean, it seems as clear as you can get that it's Mikola's rune. Um, now, whether the rune always existed in the Amber Egg and the timeline of all of that, and uh, I will just remind everyone again that there's nothing that says that it was a parting gift it just says that it was a gift so there's nothing that places it in the timeline in particular point um what exactly the amber egg is it's clearly from the Erd tree because it's golden amber and it also clearly houses ancient life what the rune of the unborn does i don't know um so there's plenty of questions there um i still am sort of of the belief that Ronnie is America's daughter, although by what means, I don't know. Uh, there is also something attractive about the idea of there's so many twins, and if we have Morgoth and Moog, and we have Mikla and Melania, and also potentially Rikard and Radon, then we might also have Radigan and Godwin, and Ronnie and Melina. And I don't know how that works, but it just... There's something about that pattern which is attractive so uh uh ronnie has two moms well she could be adopted or um a sort of imposter and that would kind of go along with the cuckoo imagery so uh i don't know why 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 is that so unbelievable it, it feels I mean, there is that in that intro, in the intro cinematic, um, in the intro cinematic, you have, um, you have a secret, right? It sh literally shows Merica and Radigan, right? Um, Mer it shows Merica and Radigan. So there is this secret that's sort of hidden in the intro cinematic, which you're not meant to understand the first time that you watch it. And then you watch it the second time, you're like, oh, holy crap. It was, it was uh, there in plain sight the whole time. You also have, while the narrator says, um, the, what does he say? The children of, of America, America's children, demigods all. Uh, America's offspring, or did she, she say offspring? America's offspring, uh, demigods all. And it shows a picture of Ronnie. So... Is that another little clue, or is it just referring to the fact that they're demigod stepchildren? Well, I don't know. There's also the fact that Radigan is Merica, so it could be just via that, but I don't know. The connections between Ronnie and Melina, and then with between Melina and Mikla and Melania. Uh, oh, also, a couple things I should mention, just as little theories that I have. Uh, I believe Melina is a memory or an echo of the spirit or soul of Merica. Um, and uh, what else? What other crazy theories do I have? Um, I think this is total headcanon, but uh, I think that Godric tried to graft a piece of Godwin to himself. And that is the pustule, which then grew into 
the sort of Godwin body underneath Stormvale, and that is why uh, it cursed the winds of Stormvale. Um, and that's why uh, there's a dragon there, because the dragon tried to... I don't know, Godwin has an affiliation with dragons, so it's it, it tried to sort of defend Godwin's death, <laughs> his life within death, uh, something along those lines. Um, the demigods are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Merica. Godric the Grafted was but a distant relation. And I believe in the Japanese that is, um, it's more clear that that is meant as a sort of clarification that, um, uh, like she's saying, the demigods are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Merica, but Godric the Grafted is just a distant relation. Um, like that's the exception, essentially. Um, so, hey, that, there we go. If they're all the direct offspring of Queen Merica, then that means that Rani is Merica's daughter. Um, Godwin's arm would then be in Stormvale, which would explain the curse on the castle. Why there's a face of I don't know if it was an arm necessarily. I think it's just that pustule that we pick up. I think it was just like a little piece of Godwin. Um, I, I, this is total headcanon. Uh, there's nothing really to suggest that this is the case. But like, I don't, I don't, I don't have a, I don't really like any other explanation for why there's this enormous Godwin body. Like, I know Godwin is replicating his body is replicating throughout the lands between through Death Root and through. Uh, through, uh, like, the crabs and things like that. But why would such an enormous version of that replicate underneath Stormvale? It just doesn't feel right to me. Um, I feel like there has to be some reason for that. So I would say the reason is um, there was a piece of Godwin that was brought there. And Godric tried to graft it, and that's what cursed Stormvale. And the, the curse, by the way, is, I think, literally a curse on the winds because all of the markings and stuff like that are facing the wind, facing the, the Western Sea. Uh, anyone else thinks that grafting, that although seems to be very important in Elden Ring and the lands between, its lore implications are not really explored in any detailed way... Um, I don't know if that it's super important, except in the case of Godric. I mean, um, I do not believe that Godfrey grafted Sarosh onto his back. I don't believe there's any evidence for that, and it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think the basic idea with Godric is that because there is no death, if you attach someone's arm, the arm is still alive. So you can just attach a bunch of limbs and pieces of people, and, and it's basically uh, all of it is still living. I think it's it's a very like materialist kind of interpretation. Um, basically, like these these body parts, even heads, uh, they they don't die. So you can just attach them to yourself, and they still uh, they still live. Now I wonder if they need to specifically be tarnished that he attaches to himself, and that may have something to do with the flame of ambition. But. Um, why do the fingers share the same pockmarks as Stormvale? Because the fingers are cursed? Dead? I don't know. I don't know if the fingers are alive anymore. I mean, it's interesting that all the two fingers are dead, except for this weird thing inside the round table, which is outside of the world, and Ronnie's, who are like giant and have multiple weird knuckles and things. So I don't I don't know what's going on there. Mikla in the Halic tree is kind of like Godwin with the roots. Mm, kind of. I mean, like anything in Elden Ring, it's related and also different. Firewalk with me says, isn't the Erd tree the result of grafting onto an older world tree? I don't believe in the great tree exactly. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity here, so I don't feel certain of anything, but 
my intuition is that there was not some other tree and then the earth tree came from that. I think basically what you have is some kind of massive roots um, and then the earth tree grows from that. However, the earth tree changed over time and the golden earth tree is a more recent invention. I believe that it was originally just a tree, like a giant tree. In the way that we see the minor earth trees are just sort of trees. Um, there's nothing golden about them. It is specifically the golden order, I believe, that creates this golden earth tree. So if you were to call, you know, is it a giant tree, the great tree? Yeah, why not? We'll call it the great tree, but I think it's still the earth tree as well. So I don't think there's a much of it. Now, the difference is that the golden part of the earth tree does not extend to the to the roots. So the golden order, and this is because destined death is connect, is sort of symbolically at least equivalent to the roots. So once you remove destined death, uh, there is no way for there's no way for the spirits to die and be locked into the lands for the tree to suck the spirits up into itself. Instead, everything sort of circulates up above. So the golden part of the golden order, the golden earth tree, does not involve the roots. And so the roots are not earth tree roots exactly. They're great tree roots, if that makes sense. That's sort of the way that I make sense of it. Um, but I, I basically think the great tree and the earth tree are the same thing. Now, if you talk about the golden tree... It's just referring to like a later stage of the great tree. There's a giant tree. Let's just say that. There's a giant tree. I think it's the same tree. I don't think there was a different tree. There's a giant tree and it's different things have happened to it. But it's the same giant tree. Uh... They start off as illusory trees. No, I don't think they start off as illusory trees. I think that is a more recent invention as well. I think that the... No, Great Tree was definitely not pre-Greater Will. I think Greater Will is uh, as early as you can get in the timeline. Because I think the Greater Will essentially invents time. Um, but I don't think they start off as illusory trees because I think the whole idea of Erd tree seeds was taboo. Like the whole idea was you start with this religion of the Erd tree. Nobody believes that there can be something as something like, uh, something like another Erd tree. They don't believe in Erd tree seeds. So the illusory trees, I think this has to be something else. Once you get the golden order, um, it you get this idea that, well, maybe you can have multiple trees. Um, you know, now you have the minor earth trees, and it starts with this minor earth tree church, which is ostensibly where the golden order, uh, at least fundamentalism, was founded, if not the golden order itself, which is where America has this echo of, let's uh, delve into the depths of the, of the golden order, right? So uh, the idea of multiple trees existing, I think, is only something that happens after the Golden Order begins. So the initial Erd tree uh, being created, I don't think starts with an illusory tree. I think it starts with a real tree. Um, um, no, Al Alec Olson, I think the, the one great is in the very beginning, but I think the if it's one, as I, I pointed this out earlier in the stream, that one great, if everything is one, then there cannot be any time. Then we get the greater will separated out things from the one. And so that is essentially the invention of time. So I think the greater will has to be as early as you can build anything from a timeline. The greater will has to be there. Um... Watch Godzilla? Um, okay, sure. Uh, is, is there a new Godzilla movie? I don't even... I didn't even know that. Um, now, I, I, in my previous video, I, I had this idea of, like, America pulling the Halfin into the real world. 
the, I'm not sure how literal that is, but I, I believe the basic idea is there. But I think if you think of the golden earth tree as being this, like, I guess we didn't really talk about the spirit world. So, but if you imagine that the removal of destined death is synchronous with the detachment of the earth tree from its roots in the sense that the golden carapace on the earth tree is now the thing and the golden carapace doesn't connect to any golden roots, the idea would be that before, when Destined Death was in the Elden Rings, the roots somehow connected to the spirit world. Because if spirits are sort of tied to the land, then that means that the land has a connection to the spirit world. And this is where I believe this idea of like, the upside down spirit world comes from, which I won't get into, but somehow the Helfin is like the mirror opposite of the living. Excuse me, I'm, I'm my throat is going. Somehow the Helfin is the opposite, the sort of mirror form of the living Erd tree, not the golden Erd tree. And I believe the golden Erd tree is a way of taking that process which was mirrored which had a life cycle and a spirit world death cycle and they sort of fed into each other like a full circle it's a way of like flipping those together so that now it's all happening on the life side it's all happening above the roots rather than below the roots something like that uh... Was there any discussion earlier on the Night of Black Knives? No. Um, I actually, I don't know how much there is to discuss there um, that's super pertinent to... I mean, I guess the, the, there's really just the big question is... Okay, well, I can just say a couple things. I believe that Merica intended to kill Godwin. Um, and I think I've been convinced by uh, Rubido in the, in the... Or Rubedo in the Discord... Um, that the purpose was to revitalize the tree. In other words, that um, the tree was dying, and so let's kill Godwin, who is Godwin the Golden, in order to uh, revitalize the tree. Then I believe that Ronnie, who was... So there was a conspiracy on Merica's part, and perhaps even on the Two Fingers' part, to kill Godwin. I believe that's makes the most sense. Then Ronnie had a plot within the plot. So she was part of this conspiracy. She was leading the conspiracy, um, I think, on Orders of America, essentially. But Ronnie wanted... She had her own motivation. Ronnie then killed her body at the same time that, Mer uh, that God uh, Godwin was killed. And that is the problem. So I think we covered most of the important things. Was Godwin a corn king? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that's super important that uh, I want to sort of put out there before we potentially get any new info. Uh, I guess there's there's like well, there's the question of why Melania fought Radon, um, and what exactly Mikola was up to. Which I don't know. Any thoughts on the snowy crone being a child of America? You know, I have considered that possibility. My sense is that uh, someone convinced me of this idea that, that the, the whole like dark moon, full moon thing is a representation of this idea of like the phases of the moon and that this represents the sort of transmission of, let's say in symbolic terms of like feminine knowledge from daughter to, uh, from mother to daughter. So in that sort of interpretation, I might say that Rena was perhaps... Let's not say Rena actually, because Rena could be, I don't know, Rena could be Ronnie's dead sister or something like that. I don't know. But um, 
uh, or it could just be a made-up name. But let's say the Snowy Crone, I believe, could be Renala's mother. Um, and it could be... Yeah, could be that. I sort of wonder if Merica and Renala are related. This is pretty frenzied, but uh, I kind of like the idea of the three sisters. Now, now my, my sort of simple explanation for the three sisters is that it's just sisters in the way that you'd refer to like sister cities. They're literally just sister rices, like because they're three of them together. So they're called sisters not referring to pe people who are sisters, but they're just the, the actual building themselves are sisters. That's, I think, the, the easiest way to avoid anything about that. However, there is a very common trope in, let's say, Greek myth and Norse myth and Celtic myth, all sorts of myths, of the three old crones, the three wise witches, the, the crones who are um, both old women who control fate and time and also beautiful young maidens. Um, so I don't know the Newman, if the Newman were the astrologers and, and Renala is an astrologer, I, you know, something along those lines, something could fit there. I don't know. It's pretty, pretty crazy, but Yeah, we have the four Belfries, but actually only three of them take us anywhere. And those three places are Paramazula, which is the heavens, uh, Church of Anticipation, which is sort of Midgard, and uh, Nokron, which is the underworld. The three is an important number. The three characters acquire in most Greek plays. Yeah, aren't there, there are three Furies, right? There's the, the, three, the three sister trope is pretty common, like the three women who have this secret knowledge and are sort of pulling the strings behind everything. Um, you know, the fates in Greek mythology, the, uh, the Moirai, I think they're called, and the, um, the Norns in Norse mythology. And the Norns in Norse mythology literally carve runes into the world tree. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Is there something compelling about that? Okay, I think we'll leave it there. I think that's a good, uh, we covered a bunch. So if any, if this triggers any ideas for people, join the Discord. It's in the description. Um, we'll talk. And I'm not going to be streaming the Game Awards tonight. I'll probably hop in uh, Ratatoska or Zyostorm stream. Um, and uh, we'll see what we get. If we do get some juicy meatballs, then um, I will probably be back on later tonight uh, to kind of look at that. If we don't, I don't know. I might, I might actually, I might try using the Discord voice channel. Um, I don't know if that'll get too chaotic, but um, yeah, let's let's see what happens. <laughs> let's see what happens. Uh, don't go hollow, folks. Okay. All right, everyone. Take care.